It's a great pleasure to, to introduce uh, Oriol Amoros, uh, who is the main responsible of uh, uh, public policy immigration, public policy in Catalonia. And uh, very grateful because I know he's uh, very busy. He, he's traveling uh, uh, around the Europe in this moment also, uh, trying to do some connection also with uh, other regions in, in Europe. Uh, um, related to immigration and then I am very grateful that uh, uh, he found uh, some time to be with us and to share with, uh, with us also uh, what uh, Catalonia has been doing uh, in terms of immigration, where we are and uh, where uh, he, he, he is trying to conduct us huh? <laughs> because he is the main responsible of, uh, of migration policy. Uh, uh, just to say that uh, uh, um, uh, this is a, a lecture, an important lecture for you because uh, uh, we will have uh, 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 the main responsible uh, that uh, will transfer knowledge and, and also um, um, communicate with you um, knowledge that is done th through practice, uh, uh, basically. Uh, and then it's a good opportunity also for you uh, uh, to ask him. And I, I, I am sure uh, Oriol is, is very open to receive even challenging uh, questions. Uh, don't worry about that. Uh, Ariel Amoros is a good politician for that also, and then he can he can defend himself for whatever question. But in any case, try to enjoy uh, uh, also and to learn a lot because I know that uh, in in the master there is some request uh, from uh, most of you that uh, come from abroad because uh, you are much more from abroad than uh, from here uh, to learn and, and to have the opportunity to, uh, because you are in Catalonia then to to know more about what. Uh, uh, Catalonia is doing in, in terms of migration management and then uh, why not uh, to pose this question also to the main responsible. This was my reaction uh, and then I think you, you, can, you can learn a lot for that. Uh, Ariel Armoros, I would say maybe two, two main things. The, the, the first thing is that uh, maybe we can, we can divide uh, politicians in two kinds of, uh, of, uh, of politicians uh, regarding the relation with academics. Uh, some that are reluctant to speak with academics Okay, because academics are, are, are speaking about many things that are completely out of the reality or, or whatever. We, politicians, we know what uh, is the reality and so on, this kind of reaction. This is one uh, uh, category of, uh, of academic, but other category that I think uh, Oriol Amoros uh, is perfectly uh, one representative, is, is somebody that is very close to academics, is always listening academics, and we establish very fruitful uh, knowledge uh, uh, exchange uh, in terms of interest and so uh, regarding uh, uh, migration. And then I, I would say that uh, this is very fruitful even for us academics uh, to speak with politicians that are uh, also open uh, uh, to listen but also open to transfer knowledge to us. And, uh, and I think Oriol Amoros is, is the best illustration of that. Uh, 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 one evidence of that is that when I recommend or I request him to be with, uh, with, uh, with you, uh, he, he, he don't hesitate. He, he just told me when and, and when and, and, and where, and then uh, uh, it, it was the fair reaction. Uh, and then I think th this is very grateful for, for us. And maybe the second one, just to present it, to say something before, before he, yeah, he, uh, he, he, he takes the, uh, uh, um, um, uh, the speed now, uh, is that uh, Oriol Amoros uh, maybe uh, is the second time that is uh, is uh, managing migration policies in Catalonia uh, and uh, for, the, for the two times um, and now that is in the second time uh, when he has many features that uh, basically he, uh, he, he has a very clear narrative, very clear, you can share or not but it is very clear. Huh? Uh, it is a narrative that is being constructed through interaction between many people. I am sure uh, that, uh, he, uh, I'm, and also academician, but also with civil society, he speak a lot with civil society, and I think this is a feature that uh, uh, is very grateful um, um, and surprising because sometimes uh, uh, the narrative is not so clear uh, when politicians speak about migration, uh, even if they are uh, responsible. But also, uh, most most.
most of the policy, uh, innovative, I will say, policies that has been done in Catalonia uh, come from uh, when uh, he, uh, he is himself uh, responsible. Um, uh, in the, uh, uh, at the end uh, of the last, uh, uh, of the 90s, uh, uh, of the last century, um, uh, or, or the 20s of the last century and in, the, in 2000, uh, there were a plan that uh, uh, one of the features of the plan that was not his plan, it was a previous one, but uh, he, he, uh, they opened what we call the Catalan way of managing uh, migration, the Catalan way. Huh? And then this kind of Catalan way uh, was uh, trying to, to put uh, on, the, on the agenda that uh, uh, maybe uh, Catalonia has different questions regarding uh, migration that are not shared with Spain because there are different questions uh, that are not shared. Or there are maybe different answers. Even if we share the question, there are different answers. And then the Catalan way is, is something that is in construction uh, uh, trying to uh, to identify different questions that uh, we Catalans uh, may may pose uh, uh, to diversity management uh, that are not necessarily shared with Spain. Uh, okay, and um, different also uh, answers. Even if we share some question, but maybe we approach uh, policies differently. And then from this point of view, I will say Oriol is one of representatives that has he is constructing this Catalan way huh? uh, uh, very uh, very uh, very uh, conscious uh, I think it's very aware of that that he is constructing this Catalan way of of, of, uh, of managing uh, migration and when the feature of, of this Catalan way that maybe was not in this program in the 2000 when the Catalan way uh, began but uh, uh, is very representative to that is that this Catalan way cannot be done if it is not through uh, interaction, dialogue with civil society. Huh? And then this is an example that uh, most of the plans, uh, programs that have been done, that uh, it's the framework, I will say, of, of the policy in Catalonia, uh, is not done uh, uh, internally uh, in the administration, uh, but it is done through interaction, through dialogue with civil society. It is very time consuming. It is very because I know that Oriol is, is, is always somewhere in Catalonia speaking about that with, uh, with uh, uh, city, uh, in city halls uh, in, uh, or, or with uh, representative of the main leading uh, uh, civil society associations, NGOs, uh, trade unions. Uh, and, so, and then from this dialogue, he construct the policy. And then I think uh, this is one of the features also of, uh, of, uh, of the Catalan way that maybe was not at the beginning, but we discover that this is the way that uh, of managing migration in Catalonia. Nothing more to say. I just say what I think, eh? not uh, not because you are there, <laughs> but because well, because uh, uh, it is what I think. And uh, we are very grateful again uh, for your uh, uh, also um, involvement in the master. And uh, I hope uh, the the lecture will be fruitful. And as I say to my students also because I emailed them, that uh, I hope also that the debate uh, will be uh, so interesting than the lecture. Okay, thank you. Well. Thank you, Ricard, for your uh, friendly words. And um, before to start, I, I just want to ask, I just want to know who I'm talking to, who I'm talking to. so can you just say... Uh, where are you from? How long have you been in Catalonia? And what do you, what do you want to do in the future? Please. Well, I'm from Serbia. Serbia? I'm a PhD student here. Um, and I have been in 10 years in Catalonia. 10 years. So you're a Catalan. OK. Uh, yeah. More or less. Half Catalan. And? Oh, and what I want to do for in the future? Yeah. Well, work in immigration. OK. Sixteen years. Kind of More clearly. Hi, I'm Sonai. Uh, I'm an Iranian American, and I've been here for about like two, three months. Um, and in the future, I'm interested in doing a PhD and maybe working in migration policy. 
Okay, as a teacher, as an academic. Yeah, okay. Uh, my name is Emre, I'm from Turkey. Turkey? Uh, I've been here for four, uh, three months, and I hope to continue to have a PhD too, sociology. All right. I'm Ganesh, I'm from Turkey as well, and I've been here since September. In the future, I'd like to work with an NGO. Okay. Where? I don't know. Maybe Catalonia. From where? From Syria. Syria also, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm Cody from the United States, also a master's migration student, and I've uh, been here for uh, the immigration program for a couple months now, uh, and hope to return to the United States and work on uh, reforming immigration policy. All right. My name is Maria, I'm from Ukraine, and I'm here Ukraine. for three months. Already. Three months only. We have lots of Ukrainians in, in Catalonia. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm Michelle, I'm from the Netherlands. And I'm also a master student, so I've been here since September. And in the future, I will work at an NGO to do this migration somewhere in the EU. Okay. This Tuesday, I was with the mayor of Amsterdam. Nice. Yeah. Okay. My father-in-law comes from Egypt also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. from Brazil, mostly doing a master in migration with them. And yeah, I'm interested in basically uh, migration and accompanying minors in civil society because they were abroad. There is a member of the Spanish parliament coming from Catalonia who was elected in the recent elections that was the first uh, member of the parliament come from, uh, from Brazil. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you know her. Do you know her? Ah, okay, it's a good friend. Okay. A good friend of mine. I mean. <laughs> All right. Where do you come from? Italy. Yeah. Sorry. No worries. Mm-hmm. Eight months. Okay, so you are starting to be a Catalan, not yet, but <laughs> you are in the way. <laughs> there is a lot of Italian people, probably it's the second nationality in, in Barcelona city. In Catalonia, it's like third or fourth, but in Barcelona, uh, lots of Italians. <laughs> You're welcome. My name is Nuria. I was born here in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. I you, you, where I you studied in Laisab. In where? Ah, like me, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in working both in the NGO and academia. And kind of no, no, it's not the only Catalan. It's the only born in Catalonia. But Catalans, maybe there are more. We don't know that. <laughs> so you're agriculture engineer, like me. Okay, and like Mikhail Gorbachev also. <laughs> like Mikhail Gorbachev, a former president from Russia. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Rebecca. I'm from Italy. From Italy? Yeah, as, as well as Rene. And I'm here from uh, one year and a half. One year and half. And uh, yeah, I would like to do a PhD in history of migration, but maybe not here. Okay. My name is Takashiko Ueno. I'm from Tokyo, Japan. And actually, I'm a doing PhD in Tokyo. Mm hmm. Visiting Mr. J.P. in the University of Autonoma. Mm hmm. All right. To learn and teach. We will learn from you, sure. And you? My name is Bianca. I'm from Germany. And I'm doing a master here as well. From which land of Germany? Um, Munich. Munich. And I'm not sure where my path is going, but probably something related to migration. Yeah, probably. OK. Hello, my name is Aurelia Toloi. I'm from Austria. Austria. Yeah. I used to work already two years in the field. Yeah. I was working in a labor market oriented project from the EU, uh -huh. Austria. And I'm doing a program here that I can take like a year off from my work. And I can come back to the project if I want to. But I can also do other things. So let's see what's happening. All right.
All right. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tariq. Immigrant girls from Pakistan in Bezos. Okay. Yeah. Yes. This this team of girls, no? Okay. Okay. They came from the reception program for family reunification. Many of them. Okay. This is a very interesting program. You have to know from her. Thank you, Anna. Okay. Okay. Yes. I'm I'm afraid you will have a lot of work in the future. Yeah. I'm afraid of. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> From which part of Belgium? Mm -hmm. Thank you. From Colombia. Many people from Colombia here. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Open a camping. Okay. <laughs> so this class is going to be very useful for you. <laughs> Then, then now we know each other better than five minutes ago. So, um, if if you don't mind, I will ask you for a small favor. Could you please sit here, because I don't want to talk to empty chairs. Please, <laughs> if if you don't mind. Primera fila, tu primera, tu primera, porque así cuando me falte una palabra me ayudarás, ¿vale? Well, um, for today. I like, I like to speak a lot, so when you uh, begin to feel very tired, you want to sleep or something, please let me know, and I will finish. But um, what, what's the problem? <laughs> ah, no, don't worry. Don't worry, don't worry. I, I will tell it. There, there is the many letters on this slide, but the next slides will be uh, not so full, okay? And um, and you, as a Catalan speaker, has to be in the first line because probably I will need a word sometimes. So you or Anna will help me, or Tarik will Tarik, no? Tarik will will we'll help me as a Catalan. Okay, so today we are going to talk about uh, what has happened in the recent years, more or less, very briefly. It's not a, it's not deep history, but very. The main, the main, uh, the main ideas I want to share from the, what has happened in in, 20, in 21st century Catalonia. Then we will talk about what is the current socio-demographic context in Catalonia. I think now we are in a special moment. We, we this where we have to decide our future. So what do we do now? It's going to be very influent on the future. Um, how how we how we see the different models of uh, management of diversity in the 20th century in Europe and, and, and what we have to learn from these different situations. We have a very diverse class with many people coming from different countries of uh, Europe, also from America, so probably from your experience, we, you can tell us how do you, if you, if you think my analysis or our analysis to what has happened in the other countries with more uh, history of migration is, is a good analysis or not, probably we can discuss on that. And what we are planning to do in the future, which is the National Agreement for Interculturality, that I will explain what, it, what, is, what is it about and, and why we think now we need that. Okay? 
Um, I think in Europe, but probably also in the United States and other countries, now we have two big challenges that, uh, that comes from two big paradoxes. Uh, our societies are very diverse societies, uh, super diverse societies. There are some academics who talk about super, uh, super diversity. No? Uh, I'm not sure what are they talking about. I listen to the academics as Zapata tell, told you, but uh, what, I, what I'm sure is that our society... Uh, they know. You know better than me, probably. You, they know preferably. So you will tell me. There is a pet in the, in the room. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no problem, no problem, no problem. You can bring your pets, your children if you have, no problem. Uh, your grandparents. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I think we, ha we are living in, in two big paradoxes, uh, mainly in the European area. Uh, in U U European scene is, is very clear. The one, that paradox, one paradox is that our, we have a very diverse society, but this diversity is not present everywhere. And is not present. Uh, this classroom is a very strange thing, really. You know that. And uh, you are interested in migration issues, so probably your WhatsApp groups will be a WhatsApp groups very diverse. But if you go in any other kind of group in our society and you ask people who is in your WhatsApp groups, uh, diversity is not there. Uh, I'm coming now from a meeting with uh, mayors and uh, regidors, como es diu? Uh, councillors, a kind of uh, municipal councillors uh, from the Girona area, okay, talking about migration and things. Okay. All of them were white, except one girl who is uh, white also, from Morocco, uh, from Catalan Morocco, a Catalan Morocco girl, and uh, she is uh, representative for the first time and is the first person coming from Morocco representative in Girona province. The first one. I said, you are the first? That's impossible. How is it possible if in Girona we have around 20% of migration, and we have around, uh, and the first group of our migration are Moroccans. So she's the first one. So first, first paradox, we have a very diverse society, and this diversity is not in our minds, is not present in the reference uh, scenarios where people are looking or where people want to be like them, okay? The second paradox, which is a very European one, is that uh, is sure, is sure, is a fact, is, is not a matter of discussion that we will have migration in the future. And our discourse are always creating the imaginary and forced idea that we control this and migration is going to turn down and we, don't, we are not going to have migration. If you listen what leaders are talking about when they meet in a, in a summit, for example, the five last summits on migration of the European leaders were about how to control the borders and always the message is, well, we, met, we reached an agreement and now we have this machine to, to identify the fingerprints and through this machine we will control the flus. This is not going to happen. For example, if you see what has happened in 2018, uh, I don't know how many people has arrived because we don't know how many people is arriving. We only have an approximate idea, approximate, yeah, idea, in uh, in Catalonia and in Spain because we have municipal registers. So we have a register that's more, it's very close to the real population, but in countries like Germany, like Italy, like France, how do you count the irregular migrants? Because they are there. You cannot say we haven't. <laughs> Everyone's have. There are also irregular migrants in Switzerland. It sounds very strange, but I know people from Bolivia living based in Barcelona who usually regularly they spend some month in Switzerland, they work in, uh, in the black market, of course, and they come back. So uh, people is coming and in 2018, for example, all the European countries together, all the European countries together, and I mean all the whole Europe, not only the political Europe, the physical Europe, from Portugal to Russia, uh, has emit, uh, emitidos, has uh, made, what? 
has issued uh, 30,000 long-term work permits. Do you think this is real? So we are losing population every year. For example, in Spain, the Spanish state, each uh, 10 years we lose 200,000 each year. No, every 10 years we'll, we, we lose 2 million people in the age of work, from 16 to 64. Okay, do you understand me? Uh, we know that we are in a, in a change of the human history. For the first time in history, we are going to lose population if we don't have migration for the natural, uh, mm, natural? Natural, natural growing of population is going to decrease. And if you look specifically to those population with the age of uh, work from 16 to 64, this decrease is bigger. And we are talking and we are saying to the population that we are not going to have migration in the future, which is absolutely false. We know from U UN data that from now to 2050, in the whole Europe, from Portugal to Russia, we are going to lose around 100, 110 million people in the age of working. And beside us, there is another continent called Africa, you may know, which is going to increase from 700 till 1,100 million people in the age of working. So probably uh, our gap, we will fill the, our gap through robots, through increasing of productivity, through increasing of the tax, activi the, the, the tax of activity. I think this is very important to increase our lowest tax activity, for example, among African women or among uh, vulnerable people. Okay, we, we have to do all these kind of things. But doing all these kind of things, our economy, our well-being is only sustainable with a migration. But nobody is telling that. Nobody is saying that. Nobody is preparing our population to say, you are going to live in a more diverse society. Instead of that, we are saying kind of discourses, saying, well, this diversity we had, we are going to solve by uh, making people less different, making people more homogeneous, and uh, we are not teaching people that we have to live in a more diverse society and we have to learn how to live in a diverse society. I think this is the big issue, the big challenge we have on the future. In Europe, I think also in the United States, but I'm, I'm very prudent talking about the America, <laughs> and I think in many, in many other countries. Well, in, the, in 2006 uh, was approved the Statute of Autonomy of Catalonia, which is the main law that, uh, that uh, governs our autonomy. Okay? And in the Article 42.7, there is a word which is very difficult to find in, in constitutions and, and, and principal laws in, in the countries in the world, but there is there. That is... Uh, they must also foster intercultural relationships through the promotion and creation of areas, mutual knowledge, dialogue, and mediation. So this is a mandate we have in our first law. This is a kind of a constitution. It's not a constitution, of course, because we are not an independent country. Some of us wants to be, but it is not the issue of this class. But, uh, but our main law is, is saying that. Is saying is is, is uh, giving us this this mandate. Another thing that Ricard has said that is very true is that uh, we think that we we, we are going we we have to do in migration. Um, the last important thing is what the Secretary of Equality, Migration, and Citizenship does. Does it's me, uh, or what the Academia says? Sorry for you. Uh, the most important thing is what is happening in the door of a school. What is happening? in a health center, what is happening in a, in a job center, what is happening in a public square. So uh, everything we do is a kind of uh, politics that we have to produce together. And it's more important what the principal of a smallest school of the smallest village thinks and does than uh, what the politician says. What, everything is important, but at the end we need the participation of everyone. So, 
we have a long tradition of uh, in trying to, not always achieving, but, try, but, but not bad, trying to do it together with uh, several uh, stakeholders, mainly um, uh, NGOs, of course, associations, of course, but all kind of political parties, or, or nearly all, all kind. <laughs> okay. We try to, to have a consensus and that, okay? Okay, um, here there is no data. Probably uh, you, you, you know the data, or I don't know if you know the data of our migration, more or less, no? No, well, I will tell you then. So I, I, I haven't bring, I haven't bring it because uh, I thought you, you knew that. But Catalonia was, if Catalonia, let's, just to understand Catalonia, a few data. Uh, if Catalonia was inhabited by people who as uh, sons and grandsons and grand-grandsons of those who were here at the beginning of the 20th century, for example, uh, on 1,900, where there were at that time two million people in Catalonia, today we, will, we, we would be 2,700,000 people. But reality is that we are seven millions and a half. That's one that. Uh, we, have, we have lived three big uh, waves of migration, always migration three, three times, always around 12, 15 years, with moments of uh, increasing of the economy, as increasing with, uh, with uh, creating a lot, many, 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 many jobs, usually unqualified jobs. So people has a right at the bottom of the of the socio socio liberal uh, spaces and then growing up. So from the 20s to the 30s, we received a lot of migration. So in 1931, there were in Catalonia 31 percent of people born out of Catalonia, and since then we always had more than 30 percent of our population born out of Catalonia. The first wave in the 20th last century, they were mainly from Valencia, from Murcia, from Aragon, from regions of, of, of around Catalonia, okay? After, in the, in the 60s, from 60s to 70s, arrived more people from Andalusia, from Extremadura, from Galicia, from other places also, from the south of France and ones of them, but, but mainly from the, the south of the Iberian Peninsula. And, in, in 1972, we were 38% of our population was, out, was born out of Catalonia. And at the present, it's 36, 37, more or less. 19 from, uh, from abroad, 18% from the rest of, of the Spanish state. In, in, but what has happened in, in the 21st century in Catalonia, I think is unique in Europe. We move from six millions to seven millions and a half in just 15 years. So it means an increase of population of 20%. 20% of increase in 12 years, not 15, 12 years. So it's been a very, a very, I would say dramatic change, but when we say dramatic, we have a double, a double meaning that we don't like, okay? So a very important change, okay? Um, and the, 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 new, the new thing is that this change in the in 21st century was, uh, uh, was uh, with people not from the rest of Spain, but people mainly from abroad. From where? From everywhere. From everywhere. Uh, we have people from, ah, what? This, this is the different, the different moments of our history of migration, the 30s, the 60s, and, the, and now. And now at this moment, first is Morocco, but it was in, in 2015, it has changed a bit because Pakistan has increased and gained one position or two. Colombia is up. Colombia is up because something is happening in Colombia. There is no peace process. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, Colombian politics. I'm just saying what I see here in the, in the, in the, in the demanding of refugees. Where, yeah, and there is a country which is not there because it's something very new, is Honduras. Uh, when there is a crisis in a country, uh, mainly if this country has a good relationship with Spain and they, no, they, they don't need a visa, uh, tourist visa to come, 
uh, there is a crisis in Honduras. After six months, you, you notice it here very clearly. And Honduras is not in the... Uh, it's quite far, no? But it's the, that, is, that is what is happening, no? So this is a lot of people from all over the world. At the moment, we have seven million and a half inhabitants. Uh, 1.7 of them are born abroad, abroad of Spain also. Uh, 1.2 are still strangers because there are around a half million people that get the nationality, which is a point very difficult here with our legislation as in something we want to change. But it's on the national level, it's not in our level, and, but we wanted to change it. So um, it's very difficult. And, and if uh, the strangers are 1.2, Moroccans are just too... Um, 200,000, 200,000, 250,000 more or less, 220,000. There are 80,000 Moroccan people who have uh, Spanish nationality, so it's not in the statistics now. But there are, there are only two, so the first country is just 200. So it means that it's uh, a very diverse migration. It's not only big migration, it's also a very diverse migration. And the second group was Romanians. Romanians never been more than 100,000. There are 90, 95, 96,000. So the different groups, there is a long list. So at the present, we have people from 187 nationalities, which are um, almost, almost the whole United Nations. We are looking for this 10 nationality we don't have, but there are small islands lost in the Pacific. So if you meet them, please they tell them to come because we need them to fulfill our collection. Okay? Um, how we deal with that? With this, so the idea I wanted to, to share is that Catalonia is a country of migration. I like a lot this uh, American myth to, tell the, to explain yourself as a country of, you said you're from America, and you also, no? Okay. Ah, you too, sorry. <laughs> ah, the other America, I mean, I mean the I North America. Okay, okay, it's a good position there. <laughs> the United, the USA, okay? USA, it's okay? <laughs> um, uh, but I like this myth to conceive yourself as an immigration country. I, something has changed recently, but <laughs> till many years, the explanation of yourself were related with the immigration uh, myth. No? And I think myths are necessary for, for explain to, to the whole population uh, what ideas we want to share. And if I have a criticism from my country, is that we don't use this myth. But it's a very clear myth, or we don't use it enough. We explain our, ourselves as a migration country, but I think not enough. Yeah, but if you, look to the, if you look to the data, it's very clear. For example, another data I want to share. Only 28% of Catalans speaks Catalan to their grandparents. Only 28% to the grandparent. To the parent, 32. To your couple, 35. To your son, 42, 43, 44 maybe. So this clearly is the idea of the country that for different generations has been becoming... Uh, Catalan is not something that you inheritate, it's something that you become, no? I think this kind of myth is as, are good for us, no? But um, these myths or this popular explanation that how you deal with migration are very important in Europe. For example, there is another paradox. Migrants always tell you as you told me at the beginning of the class, that you have come here to do something, for example, to save some money, or for example, to study in a, in a master. What the, that you are doing is a master, no? Okay. But then you will come. Sorry, this is a myth. This is not true. Who knows? Uh, for the students, it's more or less true but not for the general migrants. For the general migration, this thing, how many people in Catalonia have said, I came, I will save some money, and then I will come back to Andalusia to build a house in my, in my village, and then I will live in Andalusia. No, no, from Colombia they say the same. You can say no, but from Colombia people say the same. I came here, yes, 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 yes. My sister-in-law, for example, came from Venezuela, he says, I will come back to Venezuela when the crisis is over, 
But by the way, now he's married with my, with my brother. And they seem to be happy. And I, I see her very happy here in Barcelona. So I bet we, they will stay. But what's happening in Europe? That we have national myth very close. So for our, our idea of identity, this um, false idea that migrants told us when they arrive is very good to doing nothing. For example, there are people from Germany, no? Yo. Uh, what, 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 what did the people, what, what says the people in, in the 50s or in the 60s, no, in Germany? And they said uh, when, when people was arriving from Turkey, they were Turks, they were Kurds, oh, we need these people to our factories, they are very good workers, we love them as a workers, but sure, they will save some money and come back to their countries. Okay. The, the gastarbeiters, no? The gastarbeiters, the West workers model, no? And this model, wow, is perfect for you, to, or for, for, for the idea to, don't, I don't have to do nothing, I don't have to change. It's very comfortable because these people come, produce, and then they go. So I have to do no efforts to, to do nothing, to change my society, to change who I am, to think myself differently. It's very comfortable. And this idea, everybody in this classroom, you are students of a, of a master on migration, knows that it's clearly false. But this idea was very present in, 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 German, in German politics. In fact, I think, correct me please if I'm wrong, but I think the first integration measures were took in place in national level at the end of the 80s. Thirty years after they arrived. And the first law who's talking on migration was in the crisis of the 2015, is the law on immigration that, that Angela Merkel has imposed on 2015. It's 65 years later. So, but the, 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 I'm not saying that to, to blame on, on Germans. I, I, I'm, no, 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 I'm not doing that for that. I'm, I'm saying that for reflection on what we are saying today. For example, it's clear that we will have migration. We are not opening safe paths to come. And we are talking about something like circular migration. Circular migration, do you understand me? Circular migration. What is that? No, no. We have a we have a very a very innovative project in circular migration in Catalonia. Uh, there were three thousand five hundred people from Colombia. They came on summer. Uh, they they work at, at the fields uh, in the in the sweet fruit sector, apples, pears, peach, these kind of things. Okay, that you have to pick from June to to August. Then they started to work on the vineyards. In the vineyards, you have to pick the, the raisins to do wine uh, September, October. Okay, so they work from June to October and they come back. So circular migration sometimes is a good policy. That, w that was a great idea for our um, farmers and they were a good deal for, this, for these workers. So it was a good deal. But it was a deal about 3,000 people. And we are talking about 1,008,000 people. So is important deal? No. Is one of my priorities? Clearly not. Is really important? Well, for the fruit sector, yeah. It's, it's, we have to do it. Yes, of course. It's a good policy. It's a good policy. But it's something that explains what is the social change in my country? Absolutely not. It's ridiculous. If you look at that on the European scene, there are no many more experience of circular migration. There is an experience on Andalusia, which is very discussed and very controversial um, program. This program, maybe you have heard about it, is 10,000 women who comes from Morocco to pick up the strawberries. You know that? Okay. Um, it's quite controversial because of the, the, the situation or, or, the, or the conditions of work and some harassment and sexual abuses of the, over these workers that has happened. It's been controversial. It's 10,000 workers. It's an, important, it's an important program, of course. But that explains what is migration in Spain? No. 
Is relevant on the reality on migration in Spain? Clearly not. And in Europe, less. There are other experiences in Europe of circular immigration. Some, but only small things. But if you hear to the commissar, new commissar, Ilona Johansson from Sweden, I met her this Tuesday in Brussels, and I heard to, it was her first speech with political responsibles interested in migration from regions and cities, and in his first, first speech, he talks us about, when he talks about create legal path, he, she talks, sorry, she, she talks about circular migration. I said, wow, well, it's the same idea. They come, produce, they go, we don't have to change. So it's clearly now in the, in the agenda, the circular migration. Okay, I will take advantage because we need some circular migration, but it's not the point. This is irrelevant for us. So, but if you, say, if you conceive migration, not as people who comes to work and then goes, rather than that, um, uh, the idea that they will be citizens, they will be members of our society, if you conceive that, that I think is what clearly is going to happen with migration who is arriving now, including you, Maybe you are students, maybe you come back in a more higher percentage. But some of you will, will find here this year a boyfriend or a girlfriend or something and will stay. I bet on that. So, but if you were workers, I were absolutely sure. But if you, I conceive you as a future Catalans, everything change. Because then I'm interested in giving you rights as soon as possible. No? If I think you are going to be Catalan, I will think, wow, I'm interested in that you educate your children in, a, in, a, in the same school of mine. I'm interested that you have a, a health system because you're Catalan. So if I have a public health system, why not you? So everything changed, if you conceive that in a very different way. So there were a, a, a citizenship migration plan before I was secretary, inspired by Ricard, who introduced the idea of work with the citizenship as a goal, as the, the focus where we go, at the, at the end of the road, no matter what the legislation said. I'm not thinking that to broke the laws, of course, there are national laws we have to follow, but all what is not forbidden to do in order to build citizenship, we're going to do that. If it's forbidden, we can't. But if it's not forbidden, we will always treat our citizen, our, our, our population, as a citizens. And with the goal at the end of the road that they will be citizens. Because if you do that, everything changes. And not the, not, not the political bill, the population bill. If the myth, if the, relative, if the narrative you make with population is, well, these people is going to be Catalans. Maybe not today. Maybe ten years ahead. Then there is a consensus, for example, in Catalonia about the acquisition of rights. Um, then another another thing it's important for us access to rights from the beginning. Another thing is standardized services, the same public service for all. One thing, the, the thing that I'm most proud to be Catalan. Sorry for this. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> very nationalistic uh, affirmation, but the thing I'm most proud is that if an irregular migrant today, in this, this afternoon, gets sick and he needs a doctor, he will go to the same hospital as me and he will be treated by the same doctor as me and as the president of Catalonia. He will have exactly the same doctor, and exactly in the same hospital. This is something that gives a people a sense of belonging absolutely powerful. Because if you say people, you are taking care of their safety on health, there is nothing greater than that. So this, this gives a, a kind of cohesion 
that is very important. Now, for example, three years ago, when the, the right-wing government in Spain said that it was forbidden to, to, to give uh, health assistance to irregular migrants, Catalonia says, we are going to Zezubai. The way we, now, now we are in a political situation that Zezubai is something present in our debate, okay? <laughs> but no one says nothing. There were no politician in Catalonia who says, well, someone, but with the small voices, with not popular support, who says, oh, forbid the, the migration treatment to the irregular because it costs a lot of money. No one says that. This is, this is something incredible, no? If, if you think about what is doing or what is happening in other countries, no? But here is clearly that the health, the public health system is something for all and is not a matter of discussion. And when the Spanish government said the opposite, we said we are going to disobey and population supports the Catalan government clearly. We have um, polls on that and the, the, the support was higher than 90%. That's important. Why? Because the idea is these people are going to be Catalans. We don't know if now, in one year, in five years, or ten years, but we know that they will be Catalans. Another thing that is very important um, that comes from that idea is that now you have the mandate to promote regularity. And this is the big issue. This is a big issue. Uh, I don't know if you have uh, been ta talked about the, the stranger laws in, in, in Spain. Yeah? Well, so you know that here the situation is very difficult. We have a particular um, procedure to get regularity that doesn't exist in the rest of Europe, who's called... Who's called? Araigo. Well, well, every one of you knows what is Araigo? Yeah? Okay, perfect. You are a very good group. Eh? I, when, when Zapata invites me to the university or, or other professors invite me to the university, I always like to ask to the students, do you know what is arraigo? In Catalan is arralamen. In English, I don't know. Something like rootman or... No? How, how do you say it? And Rutman or something. Rutman, uh, you're a Catalan speaker, like me. I say Rutman, but they don't understand nothing when we say, when we say Rutman, I think. <laughs> what? Try to say it in one word. Rootedness. Okay. Well, this is... It, it means to you, you, you may grow your roots in this country. Okay? So... And this is, and I always ask to the, to the university, students from the university if they know what is uh, arraigo. And the majority of groups don't know nothing about what is arraigo. And I always tell them, uh, let's go to the Rambla del Rabal, as to one boy who is selling cans, beer cans, no? And ask them from Pakistan, many people, ask to any Pakistani you meet in the street what arraigo means, and they will explain you, because everybody from Pakistan knows what arraigo means. Everybody. <laughs> And this is, this is uh, a procedure that says if you stay here three years, you have no um, penal records, see, crime records, and you have a job offer for a year, then you can get the papers, okay? I learned last week in Baden-Württemberg that there is something better in German. Yeah, 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 it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in German, if you are not exposed... Uh, if, if you have an order to be exposed, no, to return, force return to your original country, and this, this order is not going to happen because, for example, uh, it's impossible to send people to the majority of the countries of the world. So this kind of discourse about uh, we all the legal people, we have to then re return them back to their countries, it never happens. This is false, also. This is, some, this is symbolic politics. It, it happens, but with a few numbers. They send some Afghanistan boys to Afghanistan, which is very cruel, from Sweden, from German. But uh, look at the numbers. If you have uh, two million strangers and you send 3,000, 2,000, this is nothing. This is symbolic. In demographic terms, in personal terms, is, is, is very cruel, it's very strong, it's very hard. But in demographic terms, it's nothing. This is a myth. This is a European myth. 
you are telling you are telling lies to our population. We are telling our population that we control the borders, and this is not true. We are, tell, we are telling them, in, also in the United States, that makes returns around 200,000 a year, more or less, which is a lot of people, 200,000. But if you compare it to the global population, it's a change. It, it really changed the demographic situations. But here in Europe, we're talking about thousands in the whole Europe. Not 10,000, not hundred thousands, thousands. So it's more symbolic or real. Um, if you know that you can expose these people, you give them uh, a work permit after nine months. This is a new law in, in Germany. I will tell to our, all our irregulars in Catalonia. Because here they have to stay three years, and in Germany, nine months. That's incredible. Oh? Give me your address, I will send you a lot of people to your home. Okay? <laughs> because they are searching for a job here, and they, need, and they are needed in, in Germany. They have the, this idea, no? Promote regularity and promote... Um, well. So the idea is recognition of rights. How is recognition of rights? You've been taught no, about, about legislation. Okay, so you know that uh, there is a first level of rights for all foreign people and no matter which are their legal status, which includes health system, education, social, basic social services and that. Democratic rights like assembly, right to demonstrate, association, blah, blah, blah. Okay, when they get a, per a residence permit, they, they get another kind of rights. Okay. Um, but there is a problem with, uh, with the political rights, really. Um, the Spanish constitution recognized the right to vote for the strangers only in the local elections if there is an agreement, bidirectional agreement, with the country of origin. So it means that we have, I think, around... Uh, I don't remember the number. Do you remember the number? of countries where we have the agreement. It's something like 20 or, or like that. But really important are four. Ecuador, Bolivia, Peru, and Colombia. And the others are very nice countries like Iceland, New Zealand. Well, we don't have a, a big population from this country, so it's not important. But the idea that I discuss, I'm not agree, is that uh, the 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 put the, particip the political participation of your population, of those population that, that I think they are Catalans, under the laws of their original country. So if they come from a uh, dictatorship, we will never have an agreement on elections because they don't have elections or they don't have proper elections or they don't have elections that the Spanish authorities recognizes. So you are making that the people coming from a dictatorship, they bring the dictatorship in the backpack. No? And they are living here with a backpack with the dictatorship there. So this is something that has nothing to do or nothing relative to uh, what we think we have to do in our country. So how we can change it? There are two ways. One way is changing constitution, but changing the Spanish constitution is something uh, barely impossible. And changing constitution for the interest of migrants is clearly impossible. Okay? So what we have to do? My idea and what, what we think we have to do now is to change the legislation that uh, regulates how to acquire nationality. The acquirement of nationality is something very important now at this moment because my, our recent migration has come from the... 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. So now they are trying to get nationals and they are asking and applying for nationality. And what happens in our legislation? That our legislation is, uh, uh, you know uh, which years do you need to, to be a resident to, to apply for nationality here? Depends, oh, so, so you know that, okay. And tell us, please. If you come from Italy, ten years. ten years. If you come from Colombia, what? 
Two years, correct. You come from Latin America, from Philippines, from uh, Guinea Equatorial, or you are um, Sephardi, then it's two years, and for the rest of the world, 10 years. In Europe, this is uh, a, long, a high standard or a low standard? What do you think? What? High. How is the situation in... You said you come from Italy? Yeah. And in Italy it is? Eight years. I know that. In German? I think seven. Seven or eight. Probably eight. Austria, I think it's ten. Yeah, in, in, in which direction? Up or down? Up. <laughs> From eight to, eight to ten? Yes. Wow, you, you are the champions. With Spain and another three countries. So in the 27 countries of the European, European Union, there are five where the limit is ten years. There are 12 with uh, five years. So the majority is, tw is five years. And the rest are in the middle. But there is one country uh, where the, they ask you for three years only. What? Belgium. Belgium in some situations is three. In some situations, I think, is seven. I don't know why. Who's from Belgium? Who's from Belgium? You're from Belgium. Tell us, please. Are you and you? No? There is a ballon. There is a Flemish. A Flemish. Okay, perfect. And, and, and how many years do you, ask, do you ask for? I think in some situations it's three, that is true. And, uh, but the, the general situation is like seven, I think. I think, eh? but I'm not sure. If you look on the, if you look on the migrationpolicyindex.eu, mypex.eu, you will see this kind of things. There is a website very interesting. Do you know it? Mypex.eu. Okay, if you look there, you will see. No, the country who is three years for every way, you never imagine it, is Poland. I can understand that, but it's, it's a fact, okay? Because it's not coherent with uh, many other things, no? But it's the fact. Um, don't say nothing because they don't know it. <laughs> and if you say something, they will change like in Austria. <laughs> so I think the, the, the way to get political rights, more, more practical, more logical, more clear, is to get nationality. We have a, just a problem to get nationality, that there is a few number of double nationality agreements. And there is no three nationality agreements anywhere in the world that I know, as I know. Eh? Which is not um, in coherence what is happening in people's life. People's lives in the future probably will feel, I have a kind of three nationalities. This is possible. Why not? No? In the future. But at the, at the moment, there are many countries that if you get Spanish nationality, you have to lose, in theory, your nationality. For example, people from Morocco. In practice, it never happens. What, what people do is, because in, in the Moroccan law, you said you come from Morocco. It's forbidden. To stop being Moroccan is not possible <laughs> by the Moroccan law. <laughs> you are forever Moroccan. It's, it's, it's not going to change. It is something unimaginable, no? Uh, but in reality, what, what people is doing, that they are Spanish here and Moroccan in Morocco. And they, they okay. Yeah, sorry? Tell us, please. Yeah, I mean, mine is just, I have French citizenship and American citizenship and Iranian citizenship. You have three citizenships and the, and the three governments knows that. I'm not sure. Eh? <laughs> I think it's something like Moroccan people, eh? yeah. that everybody knows in Moroccan and here, but no one says nothing. Oh, that is, it's very typical from, from Moroccan policy, isn't it? Yeah. Well, so different kinds. The, the other idea I, I told you yeah, is the idea of having the same services. And the other idea I, uh, in our recent past I think is very important is political consensus. Political consensus. Uh, I'm a member of a political party. I was an MP. I'm a very um, a passionate in politics. 
uh, after this class or other day, if you want to have a beer or something, I will discuss in politics very passionately. But when I'm working as a Secretary of Migration, I set partisan political apart, and I think that it's very, very, very important to have consensus on that. That is a kind of, polit of politics that uh, you as a politician has to know that you are not going to win many votes and you can lose a lot. It's sad, but it's like that. And what is really important is not to say I'm better than the others. What is really important is I can reach agreements with the others. Maybe uh, there are other kind of policies that you can say the same, but in this policy, clearly, you have to do it together. This is very important. Because it's a, pro it, it, it's a policy about who we are. It's a policy about our common identity, our sense of belonging, our future, our future sons and grandsons. So it's something we have to have agreements. I know that is not the reality in the main political scenes in, in the world. And it's a very um, used item in the worst way you can use a political item. I know that. I know that I'm contra corriente, against the flow. Do you understand that? We know that. But it's very important. And if you reach it, the benefits are huge. First time there were a, a document, a report on, uh, on migration, where in 1992, the Girona report, 50 immigration proposals from a, a, a group of NGOs and local politicians then reach an agreement and make some proposals to the Spanish government and to the Catalan government. And then we have had a lot of experience. In 2000, we had a parliamentary commission who deals and who studies and who debates a lot about how to deal with migration. This was at the starting of, of the recent wave. At the moment, for example, uh, after the crisis on 2015 about refugee issues, um, the government decides, at this moment I wasn't in the government, it was the previous government, so I, I followed their line. Uh, they, they decide to manage the, the, the refugee situation by a board with all the municipalities, with all the departments, all the political parties, all together. Uh, last election, last uh, March, last March, I will send it to you because I think it's very interesting and we have it translated to English also. Last March, uh, we, 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 uh, we reached an agreement on how to deal on migration on the, on the political campaigns. It was in March because in March we had uh, ahead like three elections, Spanish elections, local elections, European elections. Then came again the Spanish elections, and who knows if there will be another election next month, <laughs> never knows. But uh, we see, wow, three political campaigns ahead. We has had in the recent, in the recent month uh, a big arrival of non-accompanied minors. Non-accompanied minors is probably the, um, the group of people with uh, are suffering more prejudices. Prejudices, yeah? And we are, we are facing a, a, a three com a electoral campaigns in this situation, with a big arrival of non-accompanied migrants, with some episodes of racism attacks in some centers, with, which has happened and never had happened before here. It was the first time that there were population attacking a center for migrants and for, for minors which is more difficult to understand for me, but it's that something that has happened. So we reached on March an agreement with political parties, and all the political parties in Catalan Parliament signed it. I don't say it, all of them has accomplished, <laughs> because they, don't accompl they signed the agreement and then don't accomplish, but they have signed it. So they have uh, decided to talk about migration with some basis, okay? Which is not saying, this agreement is not saying not talk about migration, and is not saying um, uh, talk only positive about migration. We don't, say, we don't say that. We say, if we talk about that, there are some rules, basic rules. 
talk about facts, talk about solutions. If we have a problem, explain your solutions, not explain how to make the problem bigger, which is what the racist does usually. No? And what, what more we said, if you don't give to a whole group a personal characteristic, which is the racism does, basically. No? Racism is that, basically, is to say the whole people from Catalonia are something, because one Catalan has done something. No? This kind of things. It's about this kind of things. It, and in fact, is how to teach about racism to politicians. The idea of this, of this treatment were to, to share, because when you have local e elections, not only seven or five teams, electoral teams, there are thousands of electoral teams, and then thousands of local debates, not thousands, hundreds of, of local debates. So they were very important uh, uh, before local elections to sign an agreement like that. It works, more or less. It's perfect, not, clearly not. But it works, more or less. Uh, I have to say that after the after campaigns, we have analyzed what 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 uh, the the candidates have said on elections, and in local elections in Catalonia, there were three items where they failed on the on the following of the agreement, but in many campaigns, quite good. There were three or th two or three it items, one related to the minors. She's very interested, eh? <laughs> uh, one about minors, and one about, um, how do you say Manteros? Uh, Manteros, do you understand me? Yeah. Top Manta. Uh, how do you say that? How do you say that? Street sellers. Street sellers, yeah. Street sellers. And there were an, another an accomplishment of the agreement on a city called Ruby about the minors also. That was all, more or less. Not in the nationalist scene, of course. Huh? Please, please. Yeah. 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 And in the that when the demonstration, one of the promoters of that was members of the both parties. Yeah. In alliance with the Ultra. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there is a No, no. Box hasn't signed this agreement because ah. Box is not present in the Catalan Parliament. Ah, okay. So there are a few parliaments in Europe where there are no racist. Well, we have racists in our parliament, okay? But not on a, not a member of a racist party who is explicitly racist. At the moment. At the moment, we have no box in Catalan parliament. Like Ireland, Portugal, and I think that's all. That's all. There are racists in all other European parliaments. Explicitly racist. No, racist, we have ra our racist, of course. But, of course, we have racist. But members of a racist party, explicitly racist, which point one is the blame is on migrants, point two is the blame is on migrants, and point three is the blame is on migrants? No. Yeah, 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 yeah. They are, they are classical, far right, and what has happened in Spain is something... Um, I would say study, but it's not to study because it's very, it's so the, from the manual. So the mistakes from the traditional parties has been so clear. So a year ago, if I could talk to the los estrategas, como os digo, los uh, strategy makers from the, the the popular party, which is the a kind of a democratic right-wing party, uh, I will tell you that what you are doing are favoring the far right, clearly. Because they, they've done 
they made the classical mistake. That is, the normal practice makes the same discourse of the extreme wing, which makes population aware that, oh, it's not so bad. So I can vote the far right. They give the permit to vote the far right. The moral permit is given by the other parties. When they fall, it's what happened. Who said who's from France? Was the classical example, no? What was done Sarkozy? Sarkozy was the, the for me, for me, from my point of view, the responsible of the of the big results of Jean Marie Le Pen or Marine Le Pen is Sarkozy. Because it was Sarkozy who adopts the discourse, the relate, the narrative of the far right and makes it a normal thing for the general population. Before Sarkozy, to think like Le Pen, maybe someone says, well, I think like Le Pen, but I know something is wrong. I have fear to say it clearly. I feel bad uh, among my friends if I said that. Who makes it normal? Nicolas Sarkozy, clearly. And that has happened in many countries of Europe. And so the Spanish politicians, probably they don't read international newspapers or nothing. <laughs> they don't read nothing, probably. <laughs> because what, 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 ha what they have done with Vox, it's been the classical mistakes. And many, many articles from the academia has write it before. It's not, it's not an original idea for Moriola Moros, no. It's something that the academia has write in many articles. So, but in Catalonia, at the moment, we are trying to have some agreements. No, 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 of course. This kind of agreement is soft policy, of course, of course. Now, we have to make laws, we have to make code, penal codes and, and that. But what you are talking about, something that someone can interpret that limits freedom of speech, is more important, I think, in my view, is more important um, your self-limits your, your, it's more important the self limits if you are talking about what the politicians can say and cannot. In an ideal democracy, probably I was in favor to ban some political parties. Those parties against the, the human rights, probably I'm, 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 I'm favor and ban, and ban them. But in the Spanish democ democracy, which this is a political opinion, sorry is not the best democracy in the, mo in the world, to say um, kindly, okay? Uh, I don't have so confidence on the Spanish democracy to give them the power to ban political parties. Because probably they will ban my party, who is in favor of human rights, but is pro-independence party, which is another thing. You can be in favor, or you can be against, it depends on you. But it's nothing about human rights. So if you give the power to the, to the Spanish democracy to ban a party, be careful, okay? Because if you are against the system, you are, if you are so critical, if you are many left wing, for example, probably they will ban you before than before the far right. Now, so that's the situation. But in an ideal democracy, uh, should, be in, should be possible to have a political party against the human rights? I think not. I think not. I think clearly not. This is how it is in uh, in German, for example. There are limits, but at the same time there are limits, and there are people who pass around the limits. No, alternative for Deutschland, for example. No? It's banned to be an anti-party. It's banned to uh, to be a fascist party in 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 German, but you have alternative for Deutschland. Uh, some data about our demography, some ideas I, I, shared, I, I shared yet. I'm, I'm not following really the, the presentation, sorry. Uh, some data to say that the, uh, four ideas of our current situation. Diversity defines us. Diversity is here to stay. Diversity remains linked to inequality. And it's the key point of our situation. I think that we are in a situation now where diversity and inequality are confused. And this is a big, this is the big problem. This is really the, the thing. The thing is this. If diversity is not linked to inequality, 
is not really a problem. But when it's linked, is when the problems come. And in, when, when, when it's very st strongly linked, it is very difficult to solve. Think about Afro-descendants in North America. Think about North Africans in France. Think about Roma people everywhere in Europe. When a diversity is closely linked to an equality, it's something difficult to solve. And our situation now in Catalonia, because our migration from abroad is quite recent, our growing was in the first decade of this century, so our migrants are not just arrived, but our situation now is that people understand and don't, and don't blame migrants to be more poor because they can understand that they are more poor because they have just arrived. But if this vulnerability is inherited by the next generation, then for the first generation you said, well, he's more poor because he has a right four years ago, so he's difficult. He, he has passed through difficulties, so um, I can understand. He, he's more vulnerable socially, he's more poor, he is not able to read or, or to write, for example. He don't speak Catalan well or don't speak Spanish well. I can understand these kind of things, but this good boy just arrived 10 years ago, five years ago. But when we're talking about the sons and daughters, thing is different. Why he's more poor? Wow, he's more poor. But he has been benefit, benef, benef, having benefits from the social state. He has received social aids. He has received uh, public schools and public health. Why he is more vulnerable? Because he comes from Bonoco. And everybody knows that people coming from Morocco are worst. No? So the problem comes when diversity is mixed and uh, with... Uh, you're not agree? Tell me. No, no, I agree with this. <laughs> it's sad, but it's the, it's the reality. It's the reality. So problems always come with sons and grandsons of the first migrants. Many people say, wow, for example, this Tuesday, no? in, in this meeting in Brussels, I was invited to talk because the moderator of the roundtable said, wow, in Catalonia, you have a lot of migration and a very positive view on migration issues. Uh, it's uh, very nice to hear from you in this Europe that is so hard. And I said, well, well, yeah, it's true, more or less. We have a lot of migration and we had quite a general positive view. We have our racist do we have quite a general, a, a, a general positive view? Yeah. But a short history. If I visit Paris, if I visit Belgium 20 years ago, 30 years ago, also I would say the same. I remember the first time I was in Paris, in the, and the, in the subway in Paris. It was surprising for me to see so many people uh, looking different. It was very surprising, and I said, "Wow, Paris is is the utopia, no? People diverse, living together, everything, what? no." And now emerge another kind of problems, which are the problems of what is called and discussed again, second or third generation. Okay, so um, I think the idea to make people understand that is that uh, we, 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 diversity remains linked to inequality. We have to separate that, okay? And the fourth item that defines our situation is that we interact, yeah, but not enough, and not everywhere. And, there, and we have many fields of segregation, many segregated spaces. I like to solve, but not so much. Eh? You can interrupt when you want. Eh? We're a diverse society. We have more than 300, in Catalan speaks more than 300, 300 languages, 310 languages, okay? We have a, a group, a, a research group on the University of Barcelona who is um, focused on counting the languages. So, yeah, 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 it's very nice. These are the languages speaking in Catalonia, uh, a part of Catalan and Spanish, Arab, Romanics, Galician, 
uh, French Amazigh. Amazigh probably says it's here uh, like the fourth language. I think it's the third language in Catalonia because many Moroccan people don't, don't tell they speak Amazigh. Many of them tell, I speak Moroccan, I speak Arabic, I speak, but they speak. If, if you look at the data on, on translator services, they are more translating from Amazigh than Arab. But people don't say, I speak Amazigh. What? The, the language. I think it be the first one, Amazigh. You, you think so? I think so. I think so. You, do you speak Amazigh? No, by my father, yes. Ah, your father, yes. Okay. Um, religion. Um, I'm very proud, oh, no, not very proud, but I, I think Catalans um, understand very well diversity, linguistic diversity. Catalans are passionate on languages. If you told a Catalan that you speak a rare language, you, you have a friend, he, he will ask you about, oh, you speak Amazigh, what interesting, I speak whatever, no? But in diversity of religion, we have to learn a lot. We don't understand that. Our history is around one religion, Catholic religion, in favor or against, because we have a long history of people against religion. In, in Catalonia, especially in Catalonia. Catalonia was called the Rose of Fire. You know that? The La Rosa de Foc? You, you haven't heard it? Barcelona was called the Rose of Fire in the beginning of the 20th centuries because there were um, big trade unions, anarchists, and against the churches. And the Rose of Fire was because they they had a hobby who was uh, to burn churches. <laughs> so so it, it was a tradition. Very, so we have a long tradition in favor of Catholic religion and against the, 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 the Catholic religion, but always around one religion. And that thing to understand that these people with other religions, it costs a lot to our population. We have a lot of problems. The, the, main, the biggest problem we have on managing diversity in our country is when a Muslim group wants to set up a, a mosque. Wow, this is a big problem. For mosques, not only mosques, also, also evangelic churches. And if they are, if they are Pentecostal, uh, the Pentecostal church here, I don't know in North America and another country in Brazil, I don't know, but uh, here the Pentecostal church is the church of Roma people. Mainly. The, you don't have Romans in Brazil. So we have here. Yeah. Um, today is, is like a Friday, no? Because tomorrow is, is, you don't go to university, okay? So then go to the La Plaza del Raspall in Gracia. Gracia, you know, the Gracia neighborhood. In La Plaza del Raspall, a lot of Roma people living there. Eh? And probably if, you, if you're lucky, maybe you found some bar or something where people sing rumba or things like that, okay? It's not a folklore image, eh? but it happens sometimes. Um, but many, many Roma people here is Pentecostal. So to open a church, if it's Pentecostal, or to open a mosque, <laughs> is one of, mm, most of the most difficult parts of my job. Eh, to put people tranquil, no, they are going to pray here. No, but they want to send drugs here. No, drugs, no, they want to pray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds strange, but for Catalans, it's very difficult to understand that people can have different religions. But at the same time, other thing is happening in our country that's probably the country that is becoming more atheistic in the world. And uh, this is, this is a, a photo on 2016. But if we have a, 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 a graphic uh, through the time, you'll see a lot of religion positions, the biggest in the world. And at the moment, for example, if you ask people, which religious are you identified with? Majority says Catholicism. If you ask, have you gone to the church last week? Last week? 8%. 9 Not more. Not more. Of course, we have to respect that, okay? But it's a big issue. To learn people to respect religious diversity is a big problem we have. For example, another big problem is at the schools. In your countries, 
is you can have halal, uh, halal food in the public schools. Is it a problem in your country? The region, because some issues in Italy are ruled by the regional level. So in public schools, for example, in Lazio, uh, public school give halal. Mm -hmm. But if you go in Tuscany, uh, not all public schools are sure mm -hmm. halal. In Lazio, yes, but in Tuscany, not. Here is a problem. But in my thought, uh, it's a problem when uh, you make a, a matter of discussion that you, you are giving uh, people the responsibilities to solve a practical problem. If you are by school by school, and, and I think it's a mistake we've made in the past, against my opinion, eh? but in the past there were another administration that says, well, this is a very difficult question to solve, let's, let's people solve it. And each school, if there is a Muslim mother that wants halal food for the children, they have to ask, wow, this is a kind of, uh, this is a big mistake. This is a big mistake. Basic rights are not matter of discussion. Basic rights are f or fundamental rights are fundamental rights. Last month, I have to discuss with a head of a school that makes uh, an internal reglamento, como es digo? An internal normative who says that you can wear um, hijab on the practice of a vocational, of a vocational school. I went there and said, sorry, you are regulating through a normative of a, of a high school a fundamental right? Please go to the, low to the low university and learn from zero. Because fundamental rights are in the constitution. You cannot change fundamental rights in, a, in an internal normative of a school or a university or something. But this is a problem. This is something we have to learn because uh, it's a problem in our country. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, recently there was this news about uh, Kunsayeva, like, yeah. uh, Minister of yeah. Education that uh, well, he was caught, apparently, if I remember well. Uh, no, no, it's a, it's, it's a, it's, no, 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 that's, this is a good question. Um, let me put in the frame for the rest of the class, okay. What? Sorry? Yeah, yes, it's, it's, it's a colleague, yeah, yes, we are from the same political party, yes, 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 we have an internal discussion. I have to call a lot of, um, of members of my party who are Muslims. On this, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of them want to, to discuss with Conseller Bargallet. Uh, um, we have in my political party many members who are Muslims. Not, not many, many, but some of them, no? And they are very, very angry these days. Yeah, I will talk to the rest of the class. Uh, how is the, the teaching of religion at schools? Teaching of religion at schools in, in Spain is framed in uh, laws that were made in 1992, that there were five laws. Um, first of this, of this law was about the relationship between the state and the uh, Catholic Church. And this law, for the Spanish regulation, is a law. International is an international agreement with the Vaticanus. How do you say Vatican in English? Vatican, with the Vatican, okay? Then, with the same image, which is the first mistake, they make another identical law for Muslims, another for um, um, Protestants, another for Jewish, and that's it. I think there is Catholic, Evangelic, uh, Muslims, and Jewish. 
as if these religions were organized as the same way as Catholic Church is. But as you may know, uh, Islam is, uh, has no organizations like, like Catholic Church, has no hierarchy in theory. There are some kind of federations and that, but each mosque is like an assembly. They choose their, 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 their imam, and they choose the president of the community, and it's like, a, it's like an assembly. So it's difficult to find something similar of the Catholic, of the Catholic Church. No? Something like this happens in France also. Um, and what says this law? This law says that if there are pupils that in a public school, what this law says, this, this law says many things. But what this law says about teaching of religion at, at the schools? This law says that um, uh, when some pupils or their families ask to receiving uh, um, classes about uh, Catholic religion, they have the right to receive it. They have to be a number. I don't remember. I think it's 10 for a school. Less than 10, you don't have a teacher, but plus than 10, you can receive a teacher, and, and they told you about the Catholic religion, okay? And then the same for the Jewish, the same for the Muslims, the same for the uh, evangelic. What happens uh, 20 years after the approbation of this law? That we have many schools with uh, teachers of Catholic religions, and we have no schools with uh, teaching Islamic religion. Why not? There are a variety of excuses on that. <laughs> In fact, it's a clearly matter of discrimination. It's clearly, it's a clear discrimination. There are practical reasons, but they, I have to recognize that my government hasn't done nothing to solve this kind of, of practical reasons. The practical reasons really exist, but also exist, so I'm also critical with my government, that we haven't solved it or we haven't done enough to solve these practical issues. Which are the practical issues? The practical issues, we don't have teachers, for example. But at the, at, the, at the end of the matter, there is a kind of fear about teaching Islam at schools for different reasons. For racism, because as I said, we are able to, to deal with diversity in general, but not with religious diversity. Our society has to learn on that. And, uh, but in fact, it's difficult to, to find the teachers. But we can now. It was difficult 10 years ago, but now we have many people from Muslim families who has grown up here, and probably some of them are able to teach. Okay, so we have to start to solve it. What happens with the Minister of Education, my colleague in the government, from my same party, what, what he has said that he made the Islam... Uh, community members very angry with him. First, one frame of my political party in this issue. What says my political party in this issue? My political party in this issue says, and I, and I also think so, that in ideal, in ideal situation, what we really want is one uh, assignatura, como es diu? Subject. Uh, one subject on religious thinking, but all religions. I think in our present situation, is good for our children and also is a need for our children to have the basic ideas about what Christianism says, different kinds of Christianism, what Islam says, different kinds of Islam, what the Jewish religion, what the Jewish religion says, and so on. I think it's basic that all the population understand and has basic thoughts or basic ideas on this. To understand many things, to understand who we are, who, where we come from, to understand art, to understand museums, to understand your neighbors, to understand your mates, your classmates, etc. That is our, our position. Our position is to have a subject on, one second, on, uh, on, on, on religion thinking, no, on religion things, general, which is general, okay? But the fact is that the Spanish law is saying that if you have pupils who ask to receive Catholic formation, you, have, you receive Catholic formation, but if you are Muslim, you are not receiving. So it's a clear case of discrimination, institutional discrimination, which is more grave. So we have this contradiction. 
Minister, Catalan Minister of Education, his idea, ¿qué? Llevo dos horas ya, hostia, pobre gent. <laughs> ah, no, no, com, uh, do you want to make a pause? Yes, please, and water, ok, ok. Pues I finish this issue and, and we start again, ok. Um, what this, what, what my, my colleague said is, we want uh, to make uh, the class of different religions and I'm going to convince the Catholics. And in a meeting with the Catholics, he said to the Catholics, open your subject, don't talk only about Catholic religion, talk about all the religions, because if you don't do so, the Muslims will be more than you in a few years. Okay? When Muslims heard this, said, and what is the problem? If we are more or less, or there are Muslims in the schools, and they, they, are, they are right, of course. I, it's a mistake of my colleague, of course. But it was the frame. Please. Uh, I was going to ask about the age of the students who are going to study all the religions, like the proposal you said yeah. regarding the religion classes, but because I think that if they're too young, like they might get confused somehow, but then we discussed it out in the break, and I thought, and I knew that some other countries are doing the same thing, like in Germany and in Ukraine, I think. So I was just gonna say that it might be like more problematic for some parents. It depends on their religious views, more or less. Why? Because maybe some people will be like no, we don't want our kids to learn anything about other religions. And it happens. But isn't that we exactly don't want why to what? To yeah, 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 but so that ma that's, ma that's the thing. But I think that for Learn the about what? Other religions. Some people are, if people are just being like, yeah, that's why I'm just saying that it might but be But it's like if people doesn't want to study maths. What? It's like people that doesn't want to study maths. But I think this is more related to beliefs other than like, no, it depends. I'm not talking about telling um, um, I don't find the word. I know, it's like having yeah, yeah, it's just having like a the class basic of knowledge of religion. religious culture yeah, 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 yeah. is not about the believing, the believings or the dogmas or the, yeah. the things you have to believe. Yeah. No, of course not. Of yeah, course yeah. in a public school you, can, you cannot teach that, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. But it's about um, what this religion says. You know, this is good, Just and no matter the age. No, it depends on the. If they are very young, you teach some things, and if they are older, another ones. But uh, I think we have to le to learn to live with different believing around us. Yeah, this is not my point of view. I'm just saying that some people might... Well, 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 well. I, I totally agree. Okay. But okay. I okay. Want to say something? <laughs> So um, we have this in schools that it's called ethics. Yeah. So it's without putting any value in it. So you learn about hmm. international, like our globe, hmm. and what religions are there without saying these are good ones, these are bad ones. Hmm. And this is provided for hmm. Uh, hmm. children. They are not Catholic or hmm. maybe hmm. not a religion hmm. or not even having a religion hmm. because it's a kind of a knowledge gap. Like you're hmm. lacking a knowledge if you're not aware of what is existing in this world. So we call it ethics, this subject in yeah. Austria. It's good. It's good. I think it's a good uh, way to solve it. I just wanted to react back because I think it's really interesting to propose history of religions, but for young students, maybe it's boring because it's too normative too. It's boring because it's knowledge that we try to teach them. Maybe it would be better to foster the, the diversity in schools and foster dialogue in more informal way rather than giving classes about something, but organize activities and exchanges and even ask their opinions maybe. But because classes, it's so easy to not listen to what the teachers say. This is a, sec a second discussion is how to do it. No? And you can choose different ways. For example, it could be a good, a good occasion. One thing I think, uh, education is the most important social policy always. 
and the other social policies are variations of education. So education is central, always. And what we can do in education? Because, of course, we, uh, experts say, uh, you have to invest more money. Okay, that's easy to say. Always we need more money for everything. Okay, but you have the money you have, so this, the, you can make a dramatic change on that. You can make a, a small increase, but not a dramatic change. Um, another say that experts say is, to, to, in order to improve education, eh, is we have to improve the formation of teachers. Perfect. Absolutely agree. If tomorrow we will have the best university in the world for teaching teachers, the effects will come after 20 years. If tomorrow we solve it. No? So what we can do in short term, because in Catalonia we need results at short term, is now that the, the sons and daughters of the first generation of migrants are at 10 years old at the school, are going to, to go up out of the high schools. Is now we need results. And what we can do at short term, there are different things that, that works and not very expensive. Of course we need more money. Eh? I'm, not, I'm not avoiding this debate. I'm just saying that I need to think at the short term. One thing we can do is not very imaginative. It's very, it's very, it's, it's um, school reinforcement. We have different programs. There is a program of um, with this university, where some uh, students of this university goes to the high schools on uh, Raval and and the center of Barcelona, and they. Uh, make some kind of orientation, or, or, orientation to the pupils at uh, 60 years old. When the compulsory school is finishing and they have to decide if continue to school or something like that. There is another program with the students from Universitat Autonoma, Autonomous University, um, which is a very nice program where in, they go students with groups in, uh, in neighborhoods where people don't have university people at, at the round which makes, uh, they make um, reinform reinforcement classes. They go four volunteer, five volunteers each school with one coordinator who earns a bit, uh, a bit of money. Okay. There are many things about that. Other things we can do to extend the, the time of learning. I think we need, to, in our country, eh? that's my opinion, we think to extend the time of learning. Now, in primary school, we have uh, uh, five hours a day. I think we need six. It's my opinion. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a consensus. <laughs> but my opinion is that, clearly. And I'm very supportive of this opinion. It's not the matter of today, but I can explain that. Other thing we can do is to align when t when what you learn during the school um, timetable and after the school timetable. To make th things around the school which are coherent on what is happening at the schools. If you have studied in the country of your parents and grandparents, probably you think, well, this is it's good, but it's not a, an important effect. But if you come from another, another country, a very different country, that helps a lot. If what happens in my private time has nothing to do what, what happens at the school, there are some difficulties there. There are many students that go to schools and every morning they say, I'm, going, I'm entering in another wall. This wall is not representing me. I'm not identified in this, with this wall. I don't see my future here. And I don't see reference here. So you have to mix, to, to find places where the, the society living around the school enters at the school, at the schools goes to the society. You need another kind of activities. For example, you need sports around the school. What helps? For example, research says, well, well, first, thing, first thing is to read research and base your policy on results and in science. First thing, because in education, 
many policies are based on believings. No? Believings. No. First, first thing is to base on results. And research says that sports increase, uh, increase, uh, no, no, um, reduces the drop, the drop up. Sport reduces drop. School reinforcement improves results. Cultural, music, and art activities improve behaviors. And family participation improves results and improves continuity post-compulsory post, um, post com, post education. Clearly. We have a, a small program which costs a few money, and I want to do it more, 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 and more, which is very simple. We go to a 16 years old classrooms. We ask the pupils if they want to volunteer to teach their parents Catalan, Spanish, and uh, IT. Yeah. In, in Raval. We started it in IT. Um, technologies, okay? To use the, the to, to make a Facebook account, things like that. Okay, to talk to your cousins in Pakistan, things like that. Yeah, this kind of things. No? To, to have different ways to communicate with your family in Pakistan. We do it at the center of Barcelona, in Raval, in a, in a high school where there, where there are many pupils from all around the world, but there is a, a big part from Asia. Bengali, Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. And it's a very simple program. The question is, um, we asked pupils, who wants to volunteer? Girls, majority. Some boy, but majority girls. And we, and we tell them, bring a parent, bring uh, relatives. Majority brings the mother. Mother, maybe an aunt. And we have a classroom like this with one girl, his mother. One girl, her aunt, like that. And we put the teacher, a girl from Pakistan who's been in university as a model, as a referent. And they meet twice a week. And after a year, they learn some Catalan, not much. They learn some Spanish, not much also. They started to use a lot of technology to talk to the, their friends in Pakistan. This is a lot, this is a success, a fully success. But the most important thing is Teachers at school, previous to that program, so told to me, and I have to content myself not to kill them, okay? They told to me, wow, my friends are not interested in scholar results. My, uh, the parents of migrants, as everybody knows, are not interested on their, on their children's success. I, was to con I had to content myself not to kill them, okay? But that, that, that was what the teachers thought. I'm a teacher, I'm a former teacher, and I know that my profession is a profession that you have to judge hundreds of people every year. So you tend to have prejudices a lot. You tend to prejudice a lot. Think about your teachers, please. And um, it's, it's, it's like this, it's like this. And the most important thing of this program, they, they learned some Catalan, they learned some Spanish, but the most important thing was the mentality of the teachers changed and more important, these mothers at the beginning of the year, we, we made a, a, a test, okay? We made a test at the beginning and at the end. And this mothers at the beginning of the year, they said that that was the last year for the daughters to study. Because, as everybody knows, at 16 years old, you have to think about get married. And there is uh, the tradition in, in, there is a practice of concerted, concerted, concerted marriages, which is very extended in, in Southeast Asia. Also in Morocco, but not so much. Among the Roma people here, more in the past than now, but it was a practice. And 100 years ago, it was a practice here. Okay. At the beginning of the course, the majority of the mothers thought that their daughters had to get married 
after a year. This is the last. You know my daughter. This is your last year. Enjoy it. But next year, we went to Pakistan. We marry you with your cousin. And then you come here. The cousin stays there. But when the cousin goes, well, the, the idea is to bring the cousin here. Okay? It's a kind of way to, 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 to be closer to your family who is there. You, give, you send money to them. You are married. You bring them when you can. It's a, it's a way to, to, to maintain some extended relationships in the family, okay? After a year, seeing or looking or watching the children twice or three times a week inside the high school with relation with the professors, with looking all what his daughter does at the school, which is an environment that these mothers doesn't know nothing about it. What is happening in migrant generation, in the first and the second generation, is a, is a generational gap which is enormous. It's like my grandparents who were a farmer from a small village in Catalonia, and my mother who comes to live to the city. They love each other, of course, but the difference of lives are absolutely different. My mother was, in, was a hippie in the 60s, you can imagine, okay? It's the same, it's the same. And after this year, watching every week, twice a week, three times a week, your daughter empowered, being important, teaching you things, having relations with important people like teachers. After this year, all mothers wanted their children to study medicine. So for me, this program is a program to prevent forced marriages. It's not explicitly a program about forced marriages. And now we are doing that in 15 high schools at this moment. We started with one two years ago, now we are in 15 high schools. In future we want more and more and more and more. For this population is a kind of prevention of forced marriages. What we can do to improve um, education? I think most important thing we can do is formation of families, putting families into the schools. Another program that we, are, we have at today, around 70 schools, is literacy. We have schools for adults on literacy, okay? And they can go to the schools for adults, but for me this is not interesting. It is interesting, of course, but it's more interesting if they come inside the school a primary school. Because when you do that, and there is research on that, and there are scientific results on that, children see at the first time this institution that you call a school as an institution close to their family. Mothers has the same, knows the same environment of their children. Teachers learn who the family of the migrants are of the children, migrants, pupils are. Put people together and things happen, always. Put people together and things happen. Another idea, which is not related to, to education, is related to put people together. I mentioned before that the most important racist crisis we suffered is related to what you, who said Luther must know is related to aggressions to uh, non-accompanied minor centers. We used to receive an average of 250 boys a year. In 2016, they came around 600. Next year, 1,800. Last year, 3,000. And, uh, three th and this year and, and the past, put together, the last two years, around 7,000 boys from 80% from Morocco, 85% more or less, 15% from the rest of Africa. They're boys. They're boys. They're boys that want to improve their lives. That's it. No more. If you ask to them, we make a survey when they arrive to these boys, 80% of them has an agreement with their families to come. They don't come from streets. They come through the help 
with the help of their parents. Their parents send them here. And they take the difficult decision when you are 16 years old to risk your life in order to help your family. When do you know the story? You love this voice. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But at the same time, they are suffering all kind of prejudices. Because they are boys, because they are, bi they are youngs, because they are mig migrants, because they are Moroccans. Let's say clear. They suffer all kind of prejudices. And we have a, 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 a mentoring program for refugees, which is very successful, because you, when you put pe people together, things happen. And you have to trust in people. People can do policy better than you, in many fields. There are things that you have to do as a public power. For example, provide, providing housing. Well, is the main responsibility for the public powers. Providing a, a, a basic income or social income. This is my responsibility. Maybe there are things that society can do, but it's that, that, that kind of things, it's better done by public policies. But there are other things that people do better than you. Showing Barcelona. Showing our cultural activities. Spending time on an afternoon on Sunday. This is better done by people than the public institutions clearly, and are important things, aren't it? Uh, so mentoring, mentoring for Refugees, I think, is a successful program. A small program with its limitations, but it's a good program. So some say to me, why don't we do, uh, a, a friend of mine, uh, a colleague of mine, said to me, why don't we do a mentoring program for minors, non-accompanied minors? And I said, yes, it's a good idea, let's do it. But the reality is that the mentors are the boys, and the mentorized are the Catalans. The reality is that when we thought this program in order to implementing it, it was not a program to teach the migrants how our society is. This is a second, a second goal. The first goal is teach Catalans who these boys are. And I can assure you, a small village, maybe the Catalan ones will know, Canet de Mar. You know Canet de Mar? You know the, the facts in Canet de Mar? In Canet de Mar, there were a center. And in this center, it was a lot of controversial in the, in the village. A lot of controversial. The mayor, who's a girl, who's a friend of mine, from my political party, asked me to, Oriol, we have to do a campaign, publicity. The campaign, publicity? in something that people has a lot of prejudices. <laughs> a politician saying something on this issue where there is so popular prejudices, you're going to lose, sure. <laughs> what we want to do is mentoring Catalans. And what we do, we bring 16 volunteers from each of the 14 main associations that there are in Canet de Mar, one volunteer for each association. And they to start, to, we tell them, you are going to be mentors, okay? And you're going to be a mentorship program to these boys. And they meet once a week, they share uh, an evening or an afternoon. We make a pilot program on this village because in this village they wear a very bad image on the boys. Well, the mayor don't lose the election, they win again the elections. The public opinion improves. There are other problems. Not, not always is, uh, is, is easy. But I can say that this program helps people to understand who is these children and what happens to them. There is a word that we use in, 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 in uh, European literature, which is non-accompanied minors. No? You, probably you've read it. In Catalan, is manors estrangers no acompanyats. We call it mena. Men is, 
No, it's not a bad word. It's just saying non-accompanied minors. It doesn't mean nothing else. But when you say mena, 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 you are forgetting that this boy is not mena. Is you are defining them about what they don't have because you are non-accompanied. No, the principal characteristic of this girl is not to be non-something. The principal characteristic is his name. He is Mohammed. He is Ahmed. He is Yusef. He is whatever. No. And what the people learn is that they don't wear. They don't wear men. <laughs> they wear Yusef, who is a boy. That probably his father has had an accident, a job, he don't earn enough money, and he said, Yusef, you have to go to Europe and send money. Okay, my father, I go to Europe. And they knew the real stories. Well, another characteristic is that uh, we have the migration in Catalonia very distributed. Did, yeah, sorry. Um, let, let, me, let me say that only. In, when you imagine migration, I don't know what, what comes in your, at your minds when I say migration, what comes in your minds, but probably comes a urban image, no? Probably? You imagine migration cities or migration rural areas. What, do you, what, do you, what, what, what comes to your mind first? Sir? Asylum seekers. You come from Germany, clearly. <laughs> Asylum seekers. Non-accompanied minors who lives in the cities, mainly, mainly, mainly. But you have this 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 distribution. How is it called? This coefficient, the Honinger coefficient. Could you repeat? Königsteinerschlüssel. You mean that? Königsteinerschlüssel. A Queenish co 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 coefficient, or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of coefficient to distribute asylum seekers. Yeah, but when, in Europe, when you think in migration, many people think about cities, not things about Rome, things about Paris, things about okay. But the reality in Catalonia is this: at your at your left hand, there is the the absolute number. So the darkest ones are big cities. But at your right hand is percentage. So we have migration everywhere. Everywhere. We have rural migration. It's migration in cities. It's very, very distributed. This is the history I told you about. Yes, this is the diversity. And this is another idea of our present situation. 53% of our migrants, not, not migrants, sorry, people with a stranger nationality, which is not exactly the same of the migrants, because there are some migrants with Spanish nationality and, and, and right now. It's 53, more than 10 years. 53% of our stranger people is uh, been living with us during more than 10 years. And if we plus all of this, it's, 80, it's around 80% more than five years. 85%. More than five, 80, but sorry, 81 percent, more than five years. Okay? You wanted to say something? Oh, we can finish first. That's not... Sorry? We can finish first. Ah, okay. No, this, this data. This is the, the demographic uh, population, the, pyram the age pyramids. You see that very complementary. So you see that and you know that they will stay because we need them. It's clear. But migrants have a secret, eh? A very strange people. Each year they become each one year elder. So no, it sounds stupid, but it's something I want to say, because sometimes there are good intention discourse narratives that says, "Oh, migrants are helping us because they are young and they will pay our 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 pensions." This kind of this kind of narrative is well intentioned. Thank you, but. Migrants each year become one year elder. So migrants mm, 30 years ahead will be elder people also. So um, I, I'd say that in order to avoid those kind of narratives that being good intention, in fact, are thinking about people 
as a th useful things. There are a kind of good, a good narrative that says, oh, it's not true that migrants uh, make social expenses, no? And they contribute more than they waste. Let's imagine if I say to you, let's make a contability about elder people. Let's see if elder people puts more money on the table or brings more money. Probably you will say to me, wow, you are inhuman because elder people, poor elder people. How do you are talking about the elder people in so pragmatical way? It's very, it's, it's, it's an ugly thing, no? It's a, if I talk about your grandmother, and let's make a contability about your grandmother. How money cost your grandmother, and how money puts your, your mother on the table at the, at the present? You will be angry, because you will say, wow, how are you talking like that way on your grandmother? Well, and why are we all talking about my neighbor in these terms, or my friend? So, I think we have to think about which society we want to be. Another, another data is unemployment rate. As you see, unemployment rates always for the migrants is the double. Incomes, national foreigners. Results at school. The, here the results are, are measured on how many, how many migrants graduate, uh, how many um, pupils graduate each year when they finish 16 years old, which is compulsory school. 90% of nationals, but so it means that a 10% of, of nationals don't, gra don't graduate the compulsory school. 20 of the rest of Europe, especially Germans and Austrians, are the worst. No, it's, it's a joke. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 30% uh, of North Africans, 30%, eh? three times more. Wow. 45%, no, 40% of the rest of Africa, like that, okay? It's very important. Another diversity we have, Roma people. We have around 50,000 people in, in uh, Roma people in Catalonia. Probably is the minority more vulnerable we have with more prejudices. Uh, last week I, was, I had a meeting with, the, with the, gen, the Director General of the Catalan Policy of Mossos de Squadra. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. What is your initial stages? Like, are they regular, irregular? Oh. They have been up there for yeah. 500 years. Uh -huh. Ah, those are the Roma people. Yeah. They are and Catalans. Like, okay, that was my question. Oh, no, they are Catalans. And they have papers. Yeah, yeah, they have arrived five, five centuries ago. Just to have, I, I, I don't have the data here, I will tell you. Um, you know what, they are, what are the po policy identification? When you go to the street and a policy asks you for papers, no? For example, you look suspicious, you have a dog, you look suspicious, please, could you identify and you show me your ID card and like that, okay? If you are Roma, you have 10 more possibilities to be identified at street. I had a discussion six months ago with the Director General of, the, of Mossos de Squadra, of our policy, of Catalan policy, Catalan police, sorry, Catalan police. And, and I, I said to him, no, because you are stopping all the day, people from Morocco, people who's black. No, no, we are do not doing that. Catalan police, never. How we can do that? Okay, let's make a study. Results of this study. If you are Roma, 10 times more possibilities to be identified than average population. If you come from Morocco, you look Moroccan, six times more. If you are black, five times more. If you come from South America, do you have a look to coming from South America? Uh, four and a half. You're black <laughs> it happens everywhere. And it's, it's, it's real, it's, it's very sad. My boss, my boss, the Catalan Minister of Social and Work Affairs, uh, is born in Catalonia, but he is son of two Moroccan people. His family comes from Morocco. 
And when, last week we went to Baden-Württemberg, as I thought, and we passed the plane that to control the the ¿cómo se dice la sirena? The, the alarm turns on when I passed, no? And it said uh, aleatory, aleatory, ¿cómo se dice? Random, random check. And my boss said to me, "Wow, I'm lucky today. The last five flights, the last five flights." He had, he looks Moroccan, he had random check. A Catalan minister, a member of the, a member of the Catalan government. That's the reality. Uh, Roma people. But at the same time, we are very diverse society. This year, boys and girls will burn in Catalonia 36% has at least one parent from abroad. And there is a statistic which is not many significant because people are not getting married now today. Ma majority of the couples just live together and don't, don't get married. <laughs> but from those people who still get married, 22%, at least one of the two of the couples are from abroad. What thinks people on migration? There is a, a regular survey which asks is uh, the main, the main um, problems of Catalonia, okay? And this is the situation. Now it's increasing a bit. This is probably for non-accompanied minors. Non-accompanied minors here. Here, when we, when we were here and here, in 2009, our economy was the, the worst year of the crisis. GDP decreases four points. I, I was the secretary of migration here. And I, I have to recognize that I was really feared. I said, wow. We have received one million and a half people in 10 years. We're facing a, a brutal economic crisis. This is going to explode. What will happen with, my, with myself? <laughs> I was absolutely afraid, not about myself, about the Catalan situation. And I have to say that, that those were the years of the crisis. Well, not bad. Why? It's very easy to imagine theories after the facts. Okay? But these are the facts. Who's in favor and who is in awe? Yeah, you had sex is not very important, age is important, where are you born is important, how do you feel is important. Ah, this is the program of uh, mentorship. Well, um, you have studied that, oh? what is the simulationist medal, blah, 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 no? Okay. So the fact is that now we want to be explicit. I will finish with that, okay? Um, I will finish with that. Uh, I think now we have to be explicit. We have to say our model is interculturalism. Why? Theory want to solve real problems? Not. But we have to share some ideas. And as I said before, I think it's very important these, these ideas should be a matter of consensus. When we talk about interculturalism, it's not just because we read the books of uh, Ricard Zapata and, and others, okay? It's because we have to learn about what has happened in different countries in Europe, no? We have to learn from France, we have to learn from Germany, we have to learn from many countries, no? And, well, probably there is a group of countries that put all emphasis on, mm, on homogeneity, on trying to get homogeneity to this by primarily an intuitive idea that if you, we all are homogeneous, it will be easier to live together, but we have to look on the, on the failure of this mother, no? Or we have to read, for example, have you heard about Ted Cantel, the Cantel Report? Who's from Britain here? No one is from Britain. 
Well, you remember, no, you don't remember because you're, you're very young people, but <laughs> probably you have read that at the beginning of this century there were in the 2000 uh, a very big riots in London. And after these big riots in London, Tony Blair, the former prime minister, uh, made a commission led by uh, a socialist who is called Ted Cantel and made the Cantel report about what has happened in London and what has happened in the British model of living together. It's a 300 pages report, very interesting, but I can resume for you in an exclusive notice for you uh, in one word or two words. We have forgot to live together. And it's something I've, I lived in Birmingham uh, once I went there. The, the municipal authorities told me, here is the Bengalese neighborhood, here is the Pakistani neighborhood, and then we went to the Yemenese neighborhood. The Yemenese neighborhood is in the middle of three highways. No, there's a highway here, highway so we start bad, no? <laughs> wow, this is the Yemeni neighborhood, <laughs> well. And in the middle, in the Yemeni neighborhood, there were a kind of, of uh, vocational center, formation center, very interesting. They learned lots of courses, many young people there, many women learning things, vocational training mainly, very interesting. But the library, La Biblioteca is the library? The library sets timetable for women, timetable for men. And I asked to the municipal authorities, this center is funded by, with public money? They said, yeah. And what do English contributors think about that? Because it's not a swimming pool. We can discuss if a swimming pool has a reason to be a time for men and five and women. But the library? What's the problem to read together, men and women? And they said to me something very clear. They said to me, uh, the English, as contributors and leisures, the English contributors, the English contributors doesn't know what happens in this library and they don't care about because they don't know where the Yemeni neighborhood is and they are not interested on what happens in the Yemeni neighborhood. Wow, that is the idea then. That is multiculturalism no? in practice. No? So, uh, we think we have to live together, and we think that we have learned from different countries of Europe is that if we want to live together, we have to do three things. First, work for equality. Second, rec acknowledgement or recognizing diversity, and then promote positive interactions. And if I talk population, and now we are trying to implement a national, to, 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 to a shift a new national agreement, and this time we will call it, uh, there, is a, there were a national agreement, I, I haven't told you, but in, in 2008 we reached a national agreement on immigration. This, it's in English, if you, if you look it for on, the, on Google you will find it, National Agreement on Immigration, Catalonia. Put it in Google and you found it, okay? 2008. In 2008 this national agreement was related to the, this moment where a million people and a half had just arrived. And in this moment, we wanted to tell to the Catalans that this wasn't a cult, that wasn't something that happens and disappears. No, it was a, a, a structural change of our society. And national agreement on 2008 was related to that. And now what we want to say to population? We want to say to population that we are a diverse society, but we are living apart. And there is only a way to live together which is working for equality in order not to identify diversity and inequality. We have to recognize our diversity and we want to promote in positive interaction situations. These three clear ideas. And I am asking to you, do you think these ideas should be a matter or could be a matter, could be a matter of consensus in your countries? All political parties could, could agree these three ideas? Work for equality? No? Oh, this idea, yes, no? No? No, the whole three? Well, let's, let's go step by step. Step by step. Is a matter of consensus working for equality?
maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe there is, of course, always there's been a, a political discussion about equality, yeah. But more or less, the idea of equality is idea, a general idea, more or less assumed as a consensus, with different levels of intensity, with different ways to achieve it. Right wing will say, well, we will achieve uh, equality if we give freedom and not putting the state at the middle, and the left wing will say we need public policies or more money on public policies. But more or less, equality could be, and I say in Catalan public opinion clearly, could be a matter of consensus, equality. Recognition of diversity could be a matter of consensus. You think so? You're very optimistic. I don't think so, clearly. Yeah, but I can I can show you like uh, ten thousands of streets of Catalonia where the neighbors don't want a mosque there. I can show you a thousand schools where parents don't want halal food on the on the public. Um, the idea is. Your has come here, you have to be like me. Oh, but they remember my mother. Don't tell me about your mother. I'm not interested. You have to forget your language. You have to forget your religion. You have to forget your color of skin. So this is not an easy idea. This is not an easy idea. But if you start by knowledge, then it's easier to acknowledge. If you start with knowledge, then it's easier to recognize. Recognize diversity at school of religions, at the moment, is not a popular idea. But if I ask to the parents of a school, what do you think about if your children at 12 years old, before go to the high school, for example, they know how to say hello, goodbye, count till 10, a short poem, a song, in the languages of all members of the class. In my children's classrooms, there are allowed 14, 15 family languages. And what parents will say? Oh, well, it's not bad to know to say something in Arabic, or in German, or in Wolof. It's not a bad thing. After that comes the other. So first, you have to know and then acknowledge. I put you another example. Who you who um, the Catalan one, the, the, the three that has born in Catalonia. Do you know what is La Gran Redada? La Gran Redada. La Gran Redada. I don't know how to say it in English. It's called the, the, the Great Persecution. Was an intent to annihilate all Roma population in the 18th century. You are students from the university with social interest, interested in diversity and migration. Wow. And you don't know that. I don't blame on you. I didn't know also four years ago. The Gran Redada is something that Spielberg should make a film. Or Spielberg, you know? Or something that in every village in Catalonia should be a monument on that. If we don't know the history of Roma people, it's very difficult to empathize with Roma people. So every pupil in Catalonia should know what was the Gran Redada. Because it, was, it, was, it not wasn't just a riot. No, no, no. It was a planified Annihilation. annihilation plan. In one night, they detain all men and women, put separate, send men to the ships. And when you were sent to a ship, you never return. And for example, near here, the Convent of San Agustí, San Agustí, have you been there? The Museum of Chocolate, Alborn, Born? A hundred meters from Alborn, there is a place called Convent de San Agustí. And there were the places on Roma people from Barcelona, Roma women and their children, were closed there. 
thousands of them in order to annihilate that. And there is no sad monument, sad nothing saying that. So how we can emphasize with Roma people if we don't know nothing? We don't know the most important thing in their history. So, acknowledge it's not an easy idea, but here's where we need good politicians, brave politicians, honest politicians. Yeah, I know, it's not easy, I know. But we can achieve, if we first know. And living together, I think, is an easy idea, generally speaking. When we speak about the school of your children, it's not so easy. <laughs> you think people have to live together? Oh, yeah. You think you cannot send your children to this school because we have to distribute between three schools? Uh, one moment, don't touch my school. No? Yeah, I know that. But generally speaking, we can achieve an agreement, an agreement on take different kind of measures. For example, measures we want there. I was with the Director General of the Police, not only to talk about identifications, to talk about how make our police more diverse. We are talking to the department, to the Ministry of Public Servants, in order to say it's not possible that Catalan administration is 98% white. Catalan people is not 98% white and Catalan speakers. We have to represent our society. We've been talking to the, to the public TV in Catalonia in order to put more diversity on the faces. Do you watch TV3? TV3? Do you watch TV3? It's the best television. It's like BBC, but in Catalan. Oh, okay. <laughs> he, don't, he don't agree with me. <laughs> no? Okay. I think it's the best, really. I, I, think, I do think so, but you, you, you don't agree, no, no, no problem. But you know that all faces there are white. And I thought to them, wow, please diversify your faces. Now we have a, a girl Who's, uh, ¿Cómo es tu presentadora? Presenter. We have the first black presenter on Catalan TV. Wow. Uh, Planta Baixa. The Planta Baixa is a program with five presenters. One is Beatriz Dudu. Is a girl. Is a Catalan girl. He, the, uh, Senegalese origin. It's very, it's very good, very clever. Or uh, there is a TV movie which is called uh, about hockey. There were a TV movie in, in which, and, and this is the end, okay? This, this is a, t a, TV, a Catalan TV movie that is in Netflix, which is called Merli. It's very good, by the way, okay. It's very good. No, it's not bad. You watch it. It's very good. It's in Netflix. If you want to see a, a Catalan TV movie popular in Netflix, look Merli, okay? Yeah, I talked to them. I went to, I, to, I went to TV3, to the public television, and I said to them, where have you filmed it? Oh, it's a typical Catalan institute. I said, no. I don't know where you have filmed it, but in Catalonia, not. Catalan high schools are not like that. There were only one black girl who was at the end of the classroom. Burrosa, como es diu? Barry, he, he, he didn't ask to go to the toilet, nothing. He haven't said nothing in, in, the, in the whole 30 chapters. And they said, oh, sorry, Uriol, you're right. You're right. Next TV movie we will change. And the next TV movie was a group of girls who plays hockey. And one of them is Moroccan family. Like, okay. We have Mor one Moroccan girl. Oh, perfect. But, I said, but they don't touch drugs. No, 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 don't touch drugs. Okay. And their family are not thieves. No, no, not thieves. Good people. Okay. What? It's problematic because each girl has a problematic with the family. With the yeah. Family. They show it's problematic that the dad is Moroccan, the mom is uh, Catalan, and then the dad is the one that is having a bit more conservative view. He cannot go with his boys. And if you don't want to start, you just work with him in, in the bar. So, yes. Right. Yeah. Well, but that is something that happens also. We can discuss it. Okay. 
There is a point there. There is a point there. And you, and you don't show the diversity among the Moroccan people. You show the stereotype. That's, that's true. That's true. That's what, not what I uh, complain. I complain to them because the majority of the group goes to the university and she goes to vocational training. And I said, wow, the Moroccan girl to vocational training and all the others to the university. But it's the first step. <laughs> let's, say, let's say in a positive way. Okay, but we have a lot of job to do. Well, sorry, I'm, I like to speak a lot, as you may notice, so I have to finish, I think. Uh, just to resume, uh, at this moment, um, our main goal is to make these three ideas popular ideas. These three ideas. You're studying a master on immigration, no? So it seems that, that this matter should be very complicated, no? Because you need a master. And there are PhD, and there is Ricardo Zapata writing books and books and books and books. No? So it seems to be very complicated. I think we have to explain it very easy. Because if not, we're not going to succeed. If we tell people that this is something for people from the university, who have some level, that has to study a lot, a bit complicated, you won't understand, you have to trust me because you can understand, we are going to lose. It has to be very simple. We have to build a very intuitive narrative. Racist has very intuitive narratives. And we have to build very intuitive narratives based in truth, based in facts. We have to say equality makes our society better, isn't it? Knowledge is always good. If, and if I acknowledge, I acknowledge. And living together is better than segregation, isn't it? I can put houses, hundreds of examples that living together is better than segregation, isn't it? We have to make this idea very popular and very, uh, with very pragmatic applications in terms of uh, educational systems, in terms of health systems, in terms of uh, urbanist. When I go to the, to the, to the urbanist, the Department of Territory. This kind of traduction, I, I, I'm, I'm able to translate that way. Now, this is the minister about uh, public transport, planification, land planification, these kind of things. And I said to them, you have to, be, to, you have to sign and put proposals on intercultural national agreement. And they said to me, as public transport about national agreement on interculturality, it has nothing to be with us. No, one minute. Let's talk about in which neighborhoods we put some inversions, which not, how has two people live, how we plan the public spaces. What happens in the public spaces? What is happening now in the public spaces? What is happening at the moment in the public spaces is something terrible. The banks you see, it, als, als banks, como es diuen banks per seure? Not banks the money, banks to sit, you know? Called? Benches, benches. Benches are unpopular for the neighbors. No, no, but, no, no, but, no, no, but why, why, why public planners now are doing this kind of benches? To avoid homeless and to avoid groups of young people not consuming. It's supposed that young people in the free time has to spend money and has to consume. If they're just talking and having a drink in a public bench, neighbors said, wow, they're trafficking drugs or something. And if they are from Morocco, wow, sure, they have drugs, sure. So for mayors at this moment, put bunches in the streets or in the places is a problem. Now look at your cities or Mediterranean cities where you, we have good weather to stay in the public spaces. Mayors are leaving benches from the street and putting horrible chairs where you can sit alone, only alone, not having interactions. So when I went to the, to the Minister of Public Planning, I said, yes, of course, you have to be a member of National Agreement on Interculturality. You have something to say. 
cultures have something to say. Everyone. Agriculture. Yes, of course. Because rural areas are getting empty. How we refill? How we put repopulation? Because many... Uh, this is a long issue. It's not true that you can send migrants to the rural areas and that's easy. No, no, no. Migrants are not stupid people, so since people is living one zone is for something. Okay? But there is an opportunity with those migrants who come from rural areas and are able to, or they have the ability or the skills to do some jobs that we lost here. No? There is a, an, an ability there. Or there is an, a possibility, for example, people who want to work taking care of elder people. But we have to teach these people to live together, to live with diversity again. And in rural areas, this is not easy sometimes. You, to, you go to, a, to the... I, I've been in, in meetings with mayors of small villages, and I told to them about... If I told to them about interculturality, they, they will send me back to the city. No? They will say, wow, these people from the city, go away. No? But if I talk to them that living together, they understand better than nothing what is to be a good neighbor, has good relationships, what it means to live together. If I talk to the recognizing diversity, it could be difficult, but they, they can find examples to knowing things, to change things. And if we talk about equality, they will say, yes, 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 equality on territorial also, on the lands, because lands have different areas, rural areas are, has inequalities. Well, you are going to sleep, I think, okay? No? <laughs> Any questions? Any final remark? From Italy. Who is from Italy? Go, yeah. I'm from Italy. <laughs> <laughs> well, final remarks from Brazil. Let me see. I have actually several. But no, no, no. I'm just going to choose one. I promise you guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in one of our classes, you know, we have learned. A bad one, I think. <laughs> well, uh, in one of our classes, we talked about the neighborhood card, right, implemented here by the municipality of Barcelona, if I understood correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, of course, uh, provides more or less equal rights uh, for those who are re registered in the neighborhood. You know, that includes, like, accessing uh, library, you know, as you said, the uh, healthcare system is more or less who accessible to everybody. Who, Do you want the name? Yeah. Ramon. Ramon Sanahuja. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and I want to know just because we talked about like irregular migrants in the beginning of the, the presentation, and you have talked about some level of equality, but I like you to um, develop a little bit more, you know, the issues of inequality between irregular and regular migrants. Mm. You know, uh, if you want contextualizing. Mm. You had two questions. That was the first? Yeah. Yes, it's all? No, no question? <laughs> Could ask for that. Um, I also have uh, another question about political rights. You know, um, that, for instance, three years ago there has been a, a referendum here. Yeah. And um, we have learned that the referendum was open to Long-term residents were included yeah. in the in the talk. So, yeah. uh, if you have something to say, yeah. Thanks. Another question? Yeah, if you want. Okay. <laughs> 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 question I think we don't have time. All right. But these questions and are... And before, actually, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> oh, welcome. I enjoy it. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I always enjoyed diverse environments, and as you can see, diversity is a good thing. But many people don't think so. They, what, what they are losing, eh? really. Um, yeah, the first source of inequality related with migration is uh, the question of papers. And the big question is, should we let enter all people who want to enter or not? This is the big issue. 
And if you decide to regulate it, in which parameters? I don't know the answer, really. I really, eh? truly, honestly, I don't know the answer. Some days I, I wake up thinking, uh, no, 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 no immigration laws, please, or ban all kind of regulation. Some days I say, well, it depends. It depends on what? It depends on the situation of labor market. But um, I think the approach, the political approach to this question is very, very, very full of um, symbolic ideas or ideological ideas and very, muy poco, very few practice, very few pragmatic. What is happening now is that uh, we are receiving a lot of um, of irregular migration data. I always think about data. In 2018 Spain, the municipal registration, you know that we in the, municip the municipalities we register people, real people, real, who is real people who is living, increases in Spain 600,000 people. 120,000 people coming from EU, so with permits, 160,000 people with different kind of permits, like yours, permit of a student, others. 380,000 people, tourists lost visiting Sagrada Familia. 380,000 people in one year that register of municipality has increased and we don't know which legal status they have. So this is a fact. This exists. First thing I always say in any Brussels meeting, sorry for the rest of Europeans, is these people exist. They don't want to talk about them. They don't want either to recognize they exist. It's incredible. We can have a meeting talking about migration all the day, integration policies, very positive things. They say, irregulars, nothing is said. You can spend a euro from the European Social Fund. European, underline, social fund. And you can spend a euro of European Social Fund on irregulars. They are, don't, they are not people. In Germany, uh, this German girl has gone. The dog was tired. <laughs> uh, in Germany, the Jesuitas, Jesuits, Jesuits, los que tu, Jesuitas, see, is another, is a religious order, told me that when they have irregular pupils or pup children from irregular families, they don't tell to the other parents. They don't have uh, an academic expedient. They don't have academic registers. They are a kind of shadow in a, in a chair. They are children. So, where we have lost our humanity? Or what we see every day, when yesterday, for example, 50 people died in the Mediterranean. 50 people. Let's imagine they were from the United States. Or they were students in a travel of our children from a Catalan high school. They were their policies, ships, everywhere saving their life. And yesterday, 50 people died trying to get Canarias. And nothing has happened. I can understand that. So, on the other hand, well, you, are, you have studied political science, no? So you are, you, except you and me, that we are agricultural engineers, but the rest are political scientists, okay? <laughs> uh, there is a, an article from Weber, Max Weber, which is the most interesting article I have ever read in politics, which is about the ethics of the, 
So how, how this he said, the ethics of convictions and the ethics of responsibility. Have you read this article, I guess? Well, you have homework for this weekend. Look for, please, on the internet. Max Weber, the ethics of... This is the... the I, I sleep very well, okay? My goal in life is to sleep well, to stay well with my conscience and what I think. I have only one problem, which is irregular migrants. Because Weber said that if you look to, the, to, the, to, the, to an issue with the ethics of convictions, no matter the consequences, this is a kind of ethics. And I look to this issue with the ethic of convictions, and no matter the consequences, I would say to everyone who comes to Catalonia, here, you have your papers. How can I deny papers to a person, to a human being? How can I deny to right to work, to right to stay, to right to move, to right to, to achieve any kind of rights, the equality, the right to vote? How can I deny that? So the ethics of convictions and no matter res consequences says to me, give papers to everyone. But the ethics of responsibility says another thing, says you have to look to the consequences. And the reality is that there is a lot of people in Pakistan, for example, who wants to come. A lot of people. We have around 60,000 people from a small village in Pakistan here. The majority of our Pakistanis are coming from Gujarat. Gujarat is a village close to Lahore. They are Punjabis. The majority of our Indian people come from the Indian Punjab. Um, there are a lot of people in Pakistan who wants to come. And there are many of them that doesn't know nothing about Catalonia. They don't know that Catalonia exists. Of course, they don't know that Catalan language exists. But they have a cousin and they want to come. So if I give papers to everyone, what will happen in our public services? Another more, 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 more hard dilemma. I have many friends from all over the world. No? I have a, very, a good friend of mine from Senegal, good friend, yeah. a very, big, very great person, really. I, I have learned many things from him. And, and now his mother has good health. But what will happen when his mother gets ill? What can I say to my friend? No, your mother cannot come. If his mother has cancer, for example, what do I have to send? What do I have to tell to my friend? No, your mother cannot come. He's a friend of mine, Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr will tell me, Oriol, my mother has a cancer. So the ethics of convictions will say, bring your mother and bring all grandmothers of Africa to treat its cancer here because we have the best hospital in the world for treating cancer, which is by the Brun, or one of the best of the world, sorry. <laughs> but a good hospital eh? of the Catalan government. The ethics of responsibility says to me, mm -mm, Abu Bakr, you cannot bring your mother, because what will happen is 200,000 mothers from Senegal comes to treat cancer in Hospital de Vallebron. So I don't have the answer, sorry. I don't have the answer. But he, right. What about the neighborhood card? You know, to which extent can that be yeah. uh, Ramon Sanauja is a very good boy, is a good friend of mine, is a very a very good civil servant. Really. No, I, I say it I say it with my heart in a hand. He's a very good civil servant. I love him. No problem. No problem. But When we're talking to vulnerable population, we have to be very clear. We don't have to confuse them. Does his, uh, he, this card has any effect? There are two reports on that made from the Al Colegio de Advocates. No. Nah. <laughs> the Lawyers Association or the Attorneys Association. Good? Bar associates, okay. <laughs> that says that it, it is not really useful. It's made more for political purposes 
which are good intention proposals. It's, it's just to say what the good thing of this card is the discourse among the general population to saying we want to protect these people, we want to, 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 to say to these people that they are members of our city, but in real, in real terms, it's not useful. It doesn't help you. If you have an order of expulsion, you're going to be expulsed. It doesn't help you. So uh, I'm more in favor to be very clear because our, our legislation on immigration issues is so confused that vulnerable, vulnerable people are, are in defense. In defense, is that right? On defense. It's on defense. So we have to tell them the truth. We have to tell them how the processes, legal processes are, what the, what the law says. And if we want to make a political position, it has to be very separated from your legal problems that you have to matter with the Spanish authorities. And my small, criti I mean, small criticism on this measure is this, that confuse a bit the people. Politically, very good. In fact, it has no results. So it confused people. Someone criticized me, for example, we prepare people who is asking to get papers, no? And we make a report to do that. So it means that those reports that we think will help people to get papers, we do it. But if we think the situation of this person, legislation is clear and they don't have they don't will have a positive answer from the Spanish authorities, I will not make a false report. I'm not going to make a false report. And I have a, a demonstration in front of my office every six months, more or less, <laughs> that says, say yes, say yes to the reports, say yes to the reports. But I'm not going to do that. If I do that, probably it would good image for me in front of these people. But I'm telling lies, and I'm not going to tell lies relating to vulnerable people. I'm not going to give a paper to vulnerable people, which is useful for my political discourse, but is not useful for this person. I think that is to play with vulnerable people. I'm not going to do that. The last one. In relation with the discourse, uh, let's see how, how I formulate it. Before you were saying that uh, No, 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 I, I understand perfectly what you're saying and I, I, I probably I explained myself in a bad way before. So it, it was a very particular situation. It, let's imagine there is a small village around eight, nine thousand people, okay? We have a very bad view on a center of minors many prejudices about what the mayor is doing. There is an added problem that I, I haven't told before, that the property of the local where the centers are is a property of a relative of the mayor, you know? So there are other stories there that saying, oh, the mayor is, 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 which in reality, what has happened, the truth is, that in summer, in summer 2018, we were searching centers anywhere. And, and um, this girl that is called Blanca, Blanca Arbell, told I have a house empty. If you want to use it, I can help. Oh, thank you, Blanca. He's losing money there. Uh, she, sorry, she's losing money there. She makes us a favor. But what is the opposition saying? 
three months before the election, the mayor is getting money and there, you know, the, the fact is that. So, of course, we have to make public statements. Yeah, I agree with you. We have to say clearly many things, of course, yeah, yeah. We have to say clear. But this situation, we are better to manage with direct contact. You can choose the way, which is more, more effective, if to communicate through a public statement, to communicate through television, to communicate through the newspapers, or in a small village, to communicate to personal relation. And I think, I think that we have to do public statements, we have to, to hide nothing, we can say the truth, of course. No, no, I agree with you, absolutely. But I always think that personal experience are better than nothing. I have, um, sorry, it's the last, the last question, the last sentence, eh? uh, sure, I promise. How do you say a good salary? A good salary, I have a good salary. And I earn money to be the most anti-racist man in Catalonia. But I have to be honest, I have prejudices. I have. Do you have prejudices? How do you manage with your prejudices? How do you um, give away your prejudices? Studying, yes. Studying in a Master of Immigration. Maybe through political action, through social participation. But in reality, I lost my prejudices with Roma people, with my friend Fernando. That is the truth. And I've been working in immigration during the last, wow, I'm older than I thought. Uh, <laughs> 15 years yet now, more or less. Yeah, no, not, not 13, 13 years. And sometimes I call to my friend Abdul and I ask to him, Abdul, please tell me that, because I don't understand that. <laughs> Could you please tell me that? What happened to that boy? No? What is happening on the, in this association or this mosque or something? This, my personal experience, is more important than the money I have earned, the, the political participation I've made, the social participation, the personal experience. So let's, Catalan, live a positive experience. What is best for your children? What do you prefer for your children? If when, I don't know if you have children. Probably not because you, you look very young. But when you have children, what do you prefer? That the, the, the classmates of your children are homogeneous or diverse? What do you prefer? If you're studying in a master of immigration, what do you prefer? All people from Morocco telling the same stories? All people from Catalonia telling the same stories? Or to have this mar marvelous classroom? No? So let people experience. Let people have experience. Let people live together. If you look to the, to the far right boats, for example, what has happened in, in, in USA? Who won the election? If you look, for example, on the, on the results on, 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 the, on the last election, in New York State, it was incredible. In New York, New York City, 96 Democrats, 4% Republicans. And in the rural area of the same state, the opposite. Where the people is living diversity? In New York. There is a study on, on far-right vote in Finland, says the same. There was a study in uh, the only village where the far-right win in Spain in the, in the elections in, last elections in Andalusia, Elegido. Elegido. And first lecture of people, oh, Elegido, there is a lot of immigration, so in Elegido wins the far-right, because there are too many immigrants. Mm -hmm. Look the, look the results there. In those houses, unifamiliar houses, where people live alone, migration is something happening beyond the garden that can enter by the night and rob you. In these quarters, far right. In a part of Adelejido, where people is living together, but with a strong inequality, migrations are really poor, no papers, living on the, on the greenhouses, sleeping on the greenhouses, far right. 
in a part of Elegido where people live together with not many money, not the most poor, and more or less in a positive coexistence. They are the far right, 4% of votes. 4% of votes. So when people experience in a positive way, um, people could, could interact in a negative way if there, is a lot, if there is a clear inequality. So we have to work on that. It's very simple, very resume, but I think it's true. And now we are trying to export that to Europe. And we have created, one month ago, a network of regions, which we call intercultural regions. And we're trying to speak to the European institutions to work this way. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs>